Maybe the biggest of all the spring days across college football on this April 20th. Welcome into the Boys of College Football, breaking down the game we all love each and every day with you, of course. And yes, uh, so many teams across the country finished up uh, their 15 workouts with spring practice, a scrimmage typically on television of some sort across college football. Of course, last Saturday was also a full day. But again, this one as well, a bit of a lighter day on April 27th, the final weekend of the month. Nebraska headlining and a few others. Washington's the oddball in May. This was pretty much it in regards to uh, some of the top schools in the country getting it on. So one of those would be in the SEC, a couple, in fact, with Texas and Texas A&M. And we have... Uh, Graham from Gigham Gazette stopping by first. Uh, it's kind of a wild card random. Whoever makes it in first, uh, we're going to go to. So we appreciate uh, Graham stopping by. How's it going, man? Hey, Graham, can you hear me? So Texas A&M, well, Graham's getting that uh, sorted out. And at this point, we hope to be talking to Texas, Texas A&M, Iowa, Iowa State, Illinois, and uh, a few others may stop by as well. But uh, Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Hey, Graham. How you doing? Doing good. How are you doing? I am doing just fine. Uh, you had to battle some inclement weather today or at least the aggies did in the maroon and white game i'm seeing uh for anybody keeping score out there uh i believe the maroon defeated the white there you go uh, <laughs> for the record but uh three quarterbacks in play and mike elko said after uh the game that uh he likes that he has three quarterbacks that he can trust and just to remind everybody out there connor weakman the starting quarterback injured uh, after eight touchdowns and two picks last year, and Marcel Reed played a few games as did uh, Jalen Henderson, who had the big uh, bowl game performance against Oklahoma State. So let's start there, Graham, in regards to the quarterback play. Yeah. Um, well, like you said, there was some inclement uh, weather, uh, and I do think that affected things more than anything for Connor Wigman, who, you know, He's going to be the starter. Uh, I think it would take a lot to unseat him. He uh, So they did a draft format for the, for the game, right? They had two team captains, Torian York, uh, linebacker, and Trey Zoon, offensive lineman. And they apparently did some drafting. Uh, and Wegman ended up on the white team. Uh, for uh, and, and Torian York drafted him. Uh, but Torian, I, I think, must have not thought until later in the draft to pick any receivers because Wigman didn't really have uh, the the uh, the top line presumed starters that he was throwing to, um, and so I think that affected his performance a little bit. And the other thing is Purdue transfer Nick Scorton, uh, defensive end. Almost every single play he was on the field, he was messing up the offense's plans. I mean, it was really impressive from him. Uh, and so Wigman didn't have a whole lot of time to throw, um and didn't have a whole lot of people to throw it to and didn't have uh great conditions to throw it in so that's kind of how you end up with the stat line he had i don't think he even had um 100 yards passing maybe a little bit over that but they tacked on a uh, a touchdown at the end with a big run from ruben owens uh what i did like from the quarterback position jalen henderson had a couple of really great throws including a, a great corner route to noah thomas um, in, in the end zone, uh, that Noah extended great for that. It was really impressive play. Marcel Reed, um, like you said, he, he had that one game in the Texas bowl against Oklahoma state. He has continued to impress, uh, his physical tools are really, I mean, you see why he was rated where he was. Um, but, uh, he, it's just a matter of putting it all together. You know, uh, he's, he's still young. Um, true sophomore. Well, I guess redshirt freshman at this point, uh, I should say. Uh, and so, um, the, the future's bright. I really think Reed has a chance to be great. Henderson. I mean, 
I, I just feel great about him uh, as, as a backup too. Uh, he brings a, a great element to the offense. And he's, he's shown some, some growth in his passing ability, I think. So do we have a quarterback battle? <laughs> uh, again, I don't think we quite have a battle. It's, it's tough to judge from just a spring game. You know, the other thing being offensive line, you're splitting up your starters between the two teams. And so it's going to be tough to get a great picture of, is our protection actually good or is it actually really bad? Wegman definitely had fewer of the presumed starters on his side. Uh, and so uh, I think that probably contributed a little bit to him um, not having quite as much time. But as far as pure arm talent, I think he definitely still is head and shoulders above the rest. Still recovering a little bit from injury, too. I know these sound kind of like excuses, but I, I, I definitely do think it would take a lot for – for him to be unseated. Wigman five for 14 for the record, 47 yards. Uh, but also in addition to not having many receiving threats, as I understand it, he played behind the second team offensive line as well. So that's an issue. Uh, Noah Thomas, is he pretty much the new Anaya Smith? <laughs> well, um, if you're talking about someone reliable, he can go to down in and down out. I, I certainly hope so. Um, their physical profiles really couldn't be more different. Noah is, I think, six foot six. Um, and I mean, he's a burner too. And Anias, you know, he had short range speed. He, he had a lot of quickness. Noah is a track guy. I mean, he can really uh, get up and down the field really well. Um, and more than that, he's a go up and get it guy to the degree that I don't think A&M quite has had since they had Mike Evans on campus. So, and, and I don't mean that to, um, overinflate the expectations for Noah as, as much as I mean, you can throw it downfield, you can throw it to the corner of the end zone. He's going to battle for it to a higher degree than, um, than we've seen since number 13 was, was out there in the maroon and white. So receiver depth is an issue. If Thomas can emerge as sort of a really true number one threat, then I think that would be amazing for the Aggies. Um, he certainly showed uh, that he is on that track today, if you were judging just by by this game, at least. So there was some thought that uh, in the latter years at Texas A&M, the last few, that Jimbo Fisher may have lost some control over the program, became a bit lax, and maybe some players were running the locker room to a certain extent, and maybe the hard work uh to the extent that it needs to be done at that level was had gone by the wayside. And I got to think that Mike Elko, you would think has reinstated a work ethic. Well, it certainly seems like it. Um, you know, I'm not out there at practice every day or, or anything like that, or, or even one of the many days, but from, from what I understand, uh, it, it definitely seems like there is a new standard um, that wasn't there before. And, I think I mentioned this maybe last time I was on, we felt making the transition from Sumlin to Jimbo, that hard work was kind of coming in, the new attitude and all this sort of thing. And I think maybe the length of time that Jimbo was there and certain other factors played into kind of the, the decline you're speaking of. But Elko is, he's a different guy than Jimbo. He, I think is a little more comfortable delegating things, first of all, um, and a little more comfortable, um, well, to say it another way, he he's very detail oriented, and that goes down to you're going to do this rep right in practice, or you know you were gonna, we're going to keep doing it. You're not just going to go through the motions, right? Uh, and so, I do think there is a different level of discipline, expectation as far as showing up to different meetings, showing up to practices, even if you are one of the star players. Um, and again, this is just through the grapevine stuff. Uh, that it seems like, I mean, it has had um, what would seem to be some casualties of that as well with certain players uh, entering the, the transfer portal uh, and, and that type of thing um, who uh, did not fare as well. Hopefully we have not. Oh, we're we back. There we go. Okay, what was I saying? We got you. You're basically talking about uh, transfer portal. Yes, yeah. So, um, 
some casualties on that end, but I do think what you'll see is a much more disciplined team, much more technically sound team, especially on the offensive line and at defensive back, which are two of the positions I think they struggled at most uh, last year as far as sort of technique versus talent. So at this point, Graham, do we have any news in the in the uh, significant news? Uh, I've seen a few Texas A&M players in the portal. Uh, one, of course, uh, you had a player, a wide receiver, who caught one pass for a touchdown last year, went to Kentucky, and he's back in the portal. But obviously he had already left. But uh, in regards to actual news or what I guess I we could consider to be reasonable expectation or reasonable speculation about uh, connections with certain players. We're starting to see with the transfer portal opening on Tuesday in the latter portion of the week, a lot of visits being uh, announced of where players are taking those visits. Um, yeah, well, we had a commitment today from a center from Utah. Uh, I will not try to pronounce his name, uh, but it, uh, it he's a, really good player from uh from what i understand not saying that i'm you know the czar of all things utah football but they do have a reputation for a physical offensive line um we hosted uh this weekend or i think are going to host tomorrow keandre lambert smith from penn state a big time receiver uh, elijah badger from arizona state um we've been connected to him um as far as outgoing transfers if that's what you're asking about jacoby matthews is the biggest name of the spring window he's a safety five star well high four star low five star guy depending on where you looked was a battle between lsu texas and a&m had some good moments but um sort of i uh, i guess wasn't as much vibing with kind of the new culture and, and things that elko had brought in so he's one who's on the way out sam mccall who had transferred him from florida state got minimal playing time he's on the way out and a couple of guys who came in during the winter window and, and i guess we're just gonna have to get used to this in the way college football works now come in in the winter window try out for spring camp and if you don't like where you're at you head out in the spring window so alex howard linebacker from youngstown state he's on the way out Derek graham i believe from fau uh maybe from troy um, there's we got one from fau one from troy and i, I get them mixed up but he's on the way out um and uh o-lineman um and yeah that's just kind of strange to see him come onto campus uh months ago and then turn around and head out so uh as far as i know that's that's kind of the action we've seen so far the aggies are definitely hoping to add a few more uh depth pieces and perhaps a starting piece specifically at wide receiver during this window graham you're hitting on the thing that is the most recent that irks me and that's exactly what you just laid out. Players leaving a particular school, in this case, after the 2023 season. So in December, January, they make a move, they make a transfer, they go to another school. They don't stay there for at least one season. They're out after the spring window. And to me, um, something needs to be done immediately there. I am completely in favor of... Uh, player movement, freedom of choice, freedom of opportunity, freedom of movement, all of that um, to a certain extent, of course. There should be some responsibility or accountability. And all that particular player in that situation is doing is draining resources from the football program and the university. They are being pursued. They're taking a visit, travel time, money, being courted. They're signing a transfer, whatever the procedure and documents involved there. They're signing a scholarship. They're receiving all this, their administrative costs. They're eating their food. They're working out. They're wearing their gear for four weeks, six weeks, three months, whatever the case might be. And then they're leaving. And maybe even on top of that, they had just taken reps from somebody else in spring practice that would have benefited from the reps and the team benefited from somebody else having the reps uh, this coming season. Now saying all that, I'm not faulting the players because they're just taking advantage of what the system is. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's kind of a crazy deal that we've sort of backed ourselves into here in college football. I say we, the NCAA uh, has, has backed themselves into as far as the system they've set up, 
you know, it's, it's weird. It's different. I, I don't think, I mean, if I had to guess that this would be the, the way it's going to be for very long, because I think a lot of people have the sense that you and I do that this really is not tenable in a long term, uh, you know, long term looking forward. But um, in the here and now, you have to have a coach and an organization that embraces how things are now, how they are going to be after the next change. And I think Mike Elko and the organization he has built definitely do do that. And that's great news for a and um, in, in sort of, well, maybe I should say the silver lining to the dark cloud that is the way college sports are kind of becoming as far as this sort of uh, situation that's growing increasingly untenable by the day. He is uh, Graham Harmon. You can catch him on Gigum Gazette. Uh, there you see all the notables right there, gigumgazette.com and uh, the X handle right there. Anything in particular people should be looking out for? Well, I mean, I'll have some content up about the spring game. Looking forward to the offseason. Um, and in baseball, number one in the country. So we'll have a lot of stuff up about them. Hopeful to make a College World Series run. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Pretty soon here, we'll be starting our opponent previews in depth uh, for the for the upcoming season. So exciting times. All right, Graham. Thanks for stopping by. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Mark. Graham Harmon from uh, Gigum Gazette leading us off tonight. And again, we hope to be hearing from five or six media contributors in the next uh, couple hours here at the Voice of College Football. As we run through what April 20th brought us on the football field, I see some comments uh, concerning Notre Dame. And, of course, the Irish were playing on Peacock, I believe, at 1 p.m. Eastern time. I saw none of that. Uh, reached out to a couple Notre Dame folks. Did not hear back. So, unfortunately... We do not seem to be getting any Notre Dame coverage today, so I really can't uh, speak to that. Although we do have uh, Michael Campbell in the chat, so I'm guessing that the feedback will be Notre Dame is primed and ready to go 16-0 and this year. I guess it would be 15-0, and 12. No, they would have to go 16-0, and having played that on-campus uh, playoff game to start. Uh, four playoff games, 12 and 0 in the regular season. Notre Dame looks primed for 16 and 0. But uh, CJ Carr, of course, uh, much talked about in Ballyhooed as well. Good to see uh, Nebraska represented with Dion and Sharice with Ohio State and a number of folks here joining us. Michael, good to see you again. Keep chopping here. We've got our Rutgers representation. And, of course, the Scarlet Knights hit the field next week. We'll hope to get you some Rutgers uh, breakdown. DK is letting us know. Mark, I'm going to assume, since I am the host of the show, that he's talking about me. Worried Caleb Downs will leave. Well, DK, I got to say, stick around a little bit longer. And um, it may not show on a daily basis because we just grind away covering college football is what we do. But I think you'll you'll come to find out I could care less if Caleb Downs leaves. That is none of my concern. It doesn't affect me personally. Uh, so Caleb Downs can play football wherever he would like. So he is he is free to leave uh, the Ohio State University. Uh, and that would certainly be my thought if I was Ryan Day, would be, if you don't want to play here, bye, see ya. So, but uh, that's everybody's prerogative at this point. And again, that needs to be addressed, uh, not concerning Caleb Downs or the players. The players are doing nothing wrong. Uh, players will do what they're allowed to do. So if they've got the freedom to leave constantly, then they will leave constantly. They will make the type of decisions that... 19 and 20 year olds will make uh iowa without a spring game per se but they had practice uh, open scrimmage whatever that looked like that was not on television by choice of iowa 
to not play on the Big Ten Network like everybody else in the Big Ten. But uh, we understand a lot of players were out. We hope to hear from Corey Bratta from the Hawkeye of the Storm about Iowa and see if that Tim Lester offense looked like an improvement today. Uh, I believe we've got uh, Sonny Verma from Illini Cast also jumping on to talk about uh, the Illini. I saw the news conference from Brett Bielema following the Illini. Luke Altmeyer, 10 for 14, two touchdowns, a buck 16. Donovan Leary, 13 for 23 for 207. And most of these spring game, post game press conferences from these coaches are rather dismal because they don't offer too much too much you can all you can gain something from them but everybody's progressing everybody looks great that is typically the rundown there uncle rico was telling us that there were four interceptions in the usc spring game um you are concerned, Uncle Rico, about Tim, and I failed to mention USC. We do hope that Tim stops by. He should be stopping by at some point to break down USC, and he was at the spring game. Now, Tim, if I know Tim, he's going to spin that into the defense, is looking remarkable at USC. But let's talk to Iowa State. We got Levi Stevenson here from Wide Right Natty Light. That's your SB Nation stop. For the Cyclones, Levi, what's going on? Not too much. Just kind of hanging out, enjoying a otherwise cold and dreary Saturday. Yeah, <laughs> I've read all the reports. Uh, I understand it was quite blustery there. Yeah, it's been windy. And elsewhere. And it's only like 40 degrees today. It's pretty pretty chilly. But yeah, pretty windy. It's kind of one of those. I didn't actually make it over to the spring game today, um, but I read a little bit about it or whatever, but it sounds like it was a very windy day and Windy days, especially in Jack Trice, the wind tends to swirl inside the stadium quite a bit. So it makes for a particularly interesting day. <laughs> okay. So what do we get out of that? The, this is what I've picked up. Rocco Beck didn't play. Said he bothered Matt Campbell. Said he wanted to play. Did yeah. all he could to get on the field, but he was taken off the field. And Iowa State's two top wide receivers, they did not play. Yeah. I think they're just trying to keep everybody healthy. It's kind of one of the I know Matt Campbell... I mean, for three or four years at least, maybe four, actually it might have been five years, they didn't even have a spring game at Iowa State. I know Matt Campbell does not really like playing a spring game very much. Um, so it's kind of one of those things I think he'd, I think if, if he would, if it were his choice, I think he would rather not have any of that. Um, a few years ago, I want to say it was 2019, maybe they did some open practices in spring, in spring where they had like a couple, like the Friday practice a few weeks in a row was open to the public and stuff like that. I think he would much rather do something like that than do a spring game. So it does not shock me one bit that he wanted to keep like Rocco back and Jalen Noel and stuff and Jaden Higgins and stuff like that. Keep those guys out, keep them healthy. No re they're, they're, they're established starters. They know what they're doing. They don't, they don't need the reps in spring ball. Like a JJ Cole would at quarterback or, or the uh, army transfer receiver would something like that. So it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me a ton that he held those out. I don't, and I don't think there's anything to read into it or anything like that. But there's good news concerning Rocco Beck's performance, the previous scrimmage yeah. uh, that he apparently tore it up uh, yeah. last week. Yeah, I mean, he's it, it's one of those things. I think he I mean, he'll just be a redshirt sophomore going in, but he he plays like an upper class when he plays like this is his redshirt senior year. He's just a very smart guy. Um, and it, it's natural for him to have a big jump from his first full season of playing time up into his second season. So um you know, it, there the same stuff that we've been hearing like coming out of spring is the same stuff that everybody's been hearing. I was like, oh, we're athletic and we're you know we're we're maybe as talented as we've ever been. We're we're athletic and you know we're glad to have everybody healthy and the the defense is looking great. And, you know, the only reason the offense can't make move football is because the defense is so good and all this. It's just you know every, everyone's hearing the same storylines this time of year. But um, it's just kind of yeah, no, it's just, it's one of those things that I would say is returning all twenty two starters on offense. Um, and or sorry, all 11 starters on offense and then most of the defense. So it's, um, 
it's one of those where you're just getting guys reps. It's kind of all there is to it. You're not really breaking in a lot of new talent necessarily. Like you're not trying to find a new starting quarterback or trying to find a new running back or something like that. They've already got, they've already got their, their starting. They've got pretty much, I would guess that they've got solidified starters for all, but the offensive line right now. And I would guess maybe a couple spots are fairly solidified there. So it's kind of just, I think uh, this spring practice, I think is really more just about growth with the established starters than there is about, trying to deal with any sort of major turnover like they have in the last few seasons, really. So, Levi, that sounds like a good thing, but is that, in fact, totally a good thing that there's a less less competition than in most locales? Uh, in this particular situation, I think it is a good thing because the last couple of years have had some turn turmoil, whether it be the gambling thing last season and having to break in a new starting quarterback or, you know, after the 2021 season when you lose – you know, an NFL roster worth of seniors. And, you know, it, it's, they, they've dealt with a lot of turnover the last couple of years. And I know part of, part of Matt Campbell's philosophy and how he builds his program, both by players and coaches is consistency um, and have in continuity. So having all 11 starters on offense back and most of the defense back, especially when on a team that was seven and five could have been eight and four or nine and three, if not for a few bad plays or a couple bad games, um, they, they were not far away from something like that. And the team is also very, very young. So it's really at this point, it's just getting reps for a young team that did that, that I think most people would agree overperformed or not overperformed, but they, they exceeded expectations last year. Um, and honestly left some, left some wins on the field probably. Um, so they, they definitely exceeded expectations last year. Rocco looked much more mature than I think we were anticipating he would. Um, so it's just a matter of getting reps, expanding the scope of the offense. I, I mean, frankly, the biggest thing for me for spring game is getting Taylor Mauser broken in as the new offensive coordinator. That would be, that would be the big thing for me looking at like the offense, especially, um, and then defense would probably be on the linebacker side and then breaking in a new, you know, a new cornerback alongside miles purchase. Um, but you know, it's, I, I, in this particular situation, I do think it is a good thing because it's such a young team that did play well last year. It's not, it's not one of those, you know, we've got great news is we've got everybody back. The bad news is we've got everybody back situations. It's, it is the good, you know, it's good news. We've got everybody back because anybody that's coming back generally played well last year. And so with losing all those close games last year, that could have turned into a couple more wins and playing in a big 12 that's anticipated to be the most competitive in college football. Well, you got a kicker who, despite the conditions here today, Kyle Conrardi, if I yep. am yep. pronouncing that correctly, yep. uh, hit yep. on three of 40 plus in conditions in which were more difficult than your typical 40 plus yep. yard field goal. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, what they would have dealt with today is about as hard as he about about as difficult of conditions as he's going to have to deal with outside of like weather and snow, outside of rain and snow or whatever. So, I mean, seeing that he went, you know, that he hit hit a few of them beyond 40 is a great sign. Um, Iowa State has been is either been, had a either had a bad kicking game or a very good one. No, no in between. Um, and hopefully we can continue the streak of having a good kicking game. Um, it's I mean in the end, college kickers are college kickers. They can be really good one minute and then be total crap the next. So it's kind of one of those things. But someone hitting three to you know three of them beyond forty yards in blustery conditions in a stadium that gets very difficult to kick in. Um, is is a good sign for sure. You know, um, I, kind of the main podcast on our network that I host forever. When we originally started, one of my co-hosts was Cole Netton. He's who's a former Iowa State kicker and actually was the most prolific kicker in Iowa State. It still is the most prolific prolific kicker in Iowa State history. Um, and he was talking about he he would he told a story one time about he how he was kicking. I think it was his junior season, maybe I can't remember which game he said it was, but it was particularly windy that day. And one time he was lining up for a field goal, and he saw the flags on the on the goalpost blow <laughs> opposite directions, and he's like, "Well, <laughs> I guess whatever." And any any he, he, I think he ended up making it or whatever. But it's just one of those things. Just the way Jack Tri Stadium is built, it, the wind is tricky. So you know, it's a good sign to see him go three or four. But I'm not gonna. You know, I'm not going to crown him a, a grow, you know, a grows a finalist or anything like that just yet. So Levi, uh, it's off season talk and the off season yeah. of the last couple of years has been more tumultuous than any in the history of college football. So there's a thought out there that, uh, everybody's safe, that there's going to be a super league. There's 70 power five slash power sure. fours now, and everybody's good to go. And then you're going to have this premier league deal. 
where the group of five is going to be included uh, and so forth. Then the uh, the large uh, portion of the speculation deals with the opposite, that there's going to be contraction. So does the Iowa State fan base uh, keep track of these rumors, proposals, speculation in regards to, you got to think that they're on the, not necessarily on the chopping block, but on, the, on the bubble. The edge they're of a, it. They're a bubble. They're on the bubble. Yeah, yeah they're a bubble. Basketball yeah. term. So it's, and that's, that's one of those things to, so the answer is, is yes and no, because the, the talk of the super leagues and stuff like that is the epitome of off season talk. Uh, and you know, they talk about, Oh, is it going to be a 30 team league? Is it going to be a 50 team league or something like that? Cause if it's a 30 team league, I would say it's probably on the outside looking in. If it's a 50 team league, I would say it's almost certainly in. So it's, it's kind of one of those where it's everybody's got a different number for how many would be included in this hypothetical super league. But I, I, I also see a lot of issues with that concept that I just don't think are going to, I think they're going to prevent this super league from happening. Um, at least how like where, you know, where the big 10, the sec break off and do their own thing. And then everybody else comes, you know, and does something else. Right. I don't, I don't, I don't see a, a, a realm where that works. Um, cause I, I don't think the TV money is there to do that. Not, not, not those two conferences by themselves. I mean, sure. Do they have, you know, 90, 90% of the biggest brands in football? Sure. Absolutely. No, no doubt, no doubt about it. But I don't think that's enough to get like, I, there's not going to be a lot of casual fans that, of schools outside of those two conferences that are going to be that interested in watching that league, especially exactly. if they're, if they're going to be like, you got all these big 12 schools, you know, the big 12 is going to be at 16 teams. I would be willing to bet that most of those fans are not going to be interested in watching this league. No. Um, other than us watching, you know, watching Iowa get shit housed by somebody in the big 10 <laughs> other than that, but like, you know, other than that, I'm, you know, we're not going to watch a league for that's playing for a trophy that we're not eligible for. Exactly. I mean, like there, that's, I think that's, that is a thing here. That's, I think is not being properly weighed by the, <clears throat> by the general public i think i think the people in charge understand that the people that are actually making these decisions are understand that and realize that one espn seems to be they got it some they got some of their own stuff to figure out and they're obviously the biggest power broker in this entire thing as far as money goes uh, as far as tv money goes and right now i don't know if espn could afford to run to to make that league happen but not without you know cutting in Fox and CBS and all these other people or whatever. And that's just dividing up that pie more. I mean, that's there's a lot more complicated discussions to be had about that. But right now, from my perspective, and you understand that I'm I'm a little bit biased in this too, being from a school that's a it's a, it's we're a bubble school or whatever. You might get in, you might not, type of thing. But from what I can tell and on my understanding of the situation is that the super a super league that doesn't that is that is uh, exclusive enough to exclude Iowa state, a school like a bubble school, like Iowa state is probably not going to happen. It's probably not viable. And if they were to break off, you know, do something and break it, you know, break football away from the NCAA, I think it's something maybe like they were talking about where you have, you know, the power four conferences and then maybe a fifth one that has G five teams go in and out or something, you know, so, something like that. That seems like the most, I don't know, logical reason, whatever you want to call it, maybe the most viable solution. And I don't even know if it's a viable one or whatever, but it's hard to get, it's hard to get too, you know, upset about anything like that. Cause we've been, we've kind of dealt with this before with the big 12. You know, there was a long time where Texas was making life very difficult for everybody else in the big 12 and making it very stressful, especially for Iowa state and Kansas state and all those schools that, you know, back in 2010, if the conference blew up in 2010, Iowa State and Kansas State are probably in the MAC or something like that right now. And you know, we've dealt with our own little you know Cuban Missile Crisis situation with with the Big 12. So you know, this this situation with well, will we or won't we get left out of a hypothetical Super League down the road is one that you're just. I don't think we're going to get. We're going to devote a lot of time and energy to paying attention to that stuff right now. Well, I believe you're right. I hope you're right, because I think that an SEC Big Ten college football landscape would be rather boring. It's a demonstrably worse product. I mean, I mean, sure. I mean, right now, see, right now, the idea of playing of Alabama playing Michigan in, in a in a, in a non conference game is cool because it's kind of a novelty. You don't, yes. you know, it, it, that's why it's cool and fun. If like 
every single week is the biggest game of all time, then none of them are the biggest game of all time. It's just a product. And that's all it is. Or whatever. It's just TV. Yeah, the the same 8 to 12 schools are going to be running into each other every season in the playoffs. And again, I I think a lot of people, and you are saying the people at the very top are not thinking in this direction, and I hope you are correct. But a lot of people are believing that you can just rip out the middle portion of the country Uh, because to your point, if you're an Iowa state fan, a Kansas state fan, Oklahoma state fan, are you watching a lot of Penn state and Michigan? Probably not, but there is a connection there. There is a, we watch our team. So you have different levels of fans. Obviously you've got your Iowa state fans and that's all they watch, but you've got your Iowa state fans who then are connected to the big 12. So their default second game is they're going to watch Oklahoma state and Kansas state play. Right. And then you've got your super, super college football fans that are watching Iowa yeah, there's, state there's the diehard nerds that'll watch it. Then they're watching everybody like else or yeah. they're watching the, the biggest product yeah. out there, but they're, the, you know, the largest team. portion of the TV fan base is the casuals that watch their team and like, the first chunk of the game right after their game or something like that. Like that's, that's the vast majority of college football viewers that I don't think the people that talk about this type of thing a lot don't really represent the majority of the TV yes. watching population of college football. And the problem is too, is that those people are also not on Twitter to talk about this stuff. <laughs> so this conversation exists in a weird ecosystem where the, the majority voice of what of the the majority of college football viewers and how they consume college football content aren't talking about this on social media with the people that a lot of them are kind of the college football nerds that will tune in to, you know, they'll tune into Ohio Toledo on a Wednesday night just because type of thing, you know, that it's, there's a misunderstanding of what college football fans, what, what the, what the general college football fan is and what, what they're, what they behave like and what they watch. And most of them are not making appointments to watch, teams of other conferences and you know, some, some will make, will watch other teams in the conference, especially if they're on their schedule coming up or something like that. And there's even fewer that will watch teams outside of the conference, especially if it's not like a rival or something like that, you know, it's, I don't know. It's a weird thing. There's some, there are days there are times and you see headlines come out where it does feel like nobody's at the wheel, (laughs) but you know, I don't know. It's it's kind of one of those things where it's what's going to happen is going to happen. And if we are left out, then we're just going to go have fun at the other table and have fun doing our own thing. There's lots of FCS. There's lots of FCS fans that have had a plenty good time over the years cheering for their schools, not cheering, you know, not playing for the you know FBS national championship. North Dakota State fans have had a good time over the last 20 years, you know, watching their team demolish FCS. And there's and there's lots of there's lots of things to play for and lots of fun to be had outside of trying to make it into a 12 team playoff. That's going to be 80% the same teams every single year. Um, and uh, it's kind of what there is to it. And there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of fans of big 10 and sec schools will tell you that the only, the only joy to be had in college football is winning a national championship. And that's just not, that's just not true. You know, maybe that's the only joy left to be had for Georgia and Alabama and Ohio state and Michigan or whatever, where that's, They've 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 climbed the mountaintop and now the only joy left to be had is winning a national championship. Maybe that's your reality, but that is not the reality for Iowa State or Kansas State or Oklahoma State or Arizona State or Arizona or Colorado or anybody else in the Big Twelve. That's not there. That's not anybody's reality in our conference. On our conference, we have fun playing each other. We have fun. We have fun with between the fan bases and the, you know, in, in my mind, the 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 true essence of what makes college football fun is what is deeply alive and well in the Big Twelve. And will be going forward where it's, you know, there's not a couple of blue bloods running the conference. It's there's parody where you'll see schools going up and down the standings pretty regularly. And uh, it's a lot of fun fan bases. Um, I'm, I'm just looking forward to it. If, if I would say is someday down the road in 10 or 5, 10, 15, 20 years, not playing for the same, you know, same big trophy at the end as Iowa, it is what it is. So I'm going to choose to enjoy Iowa State where they're at right now, I guess. Absolutely. Well stated. I will not take it any further than that because it would be a shame if a fun, fun league like the Big 12, which again, I I don't think it's that arguable, should be 
the most competitive in college football, not just this season, but it projects to be like that on a regular basis. I mean, yeah, I mean, Utah will be very good this year, but I think they they're losing quite a bit after this season, so that's reasonable to expect them to slide back a little bit. So now, you know, you've got a good chunk of that conference that, you know, when they're good, are capable of competing for and winning a conference title. I mean. You, I mean, Utah is obviously very good. Arizona is in a good place right now. We'll see what their new coach does, but you know they're in a good place. You know, Iowa State has been in a Big Twelve championship game in the last five years. Kansas State won one a few years ago. Baylor, Texas Tech, Oklahoma State, all of those school TCU, all of those schools are definitely capable of competing for conference titles. You know, Cincinnati has previously made a playoff, and UCF has obviously had their successes and stuff like that too. Kansas is <laughs> I forgot about Kansas. <laughs> Kansas is a, is a good program now. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things. There's 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 going to be a lots of moving up and down, and the Big Twelve is going to be, in, in my opinion, this season and going forward, should be the most fun league to pay attention to for college football nerds. If you're in SEC school and all you care about is Alabama and Auburn, you know, I can't I can't help you there. There's no blue bloods in the conference left, but there is a lot of fun football to be had, and. That's what we're here for. I don't. I don't know about you guys, but the day we start talking about why but titles only mattering and not like everybody enjoying themselves is to me. That's when you've veered off the wrong path. Is when 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 having fun matters less than you know the all out ruthless chase of trophies. I guess. Well, yeah, all this was designed to be a um, departure from real life, so. <laughs> yeah it's like you know it's like and if, if if we're all not if we're you know we're chasing trophies but everyone's miserable the whole time you know look at penn state everyone's miserable all the time even though they're chasing trophies you know it's one of those or ohio state even though they do win some trophies but they're if they're not winning trophies they're miserable you know so it's one of those like i guess that might be fun i don't know it doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me when you know going 10 and 2 and winning a january you know winning a january bowl game isn't isn't a good season that sounds horrible that sounds really miserable but um you know i you know i would say it's never going to be a blue blood probably i think they missed that train um you know they probably needed to get good 50 years ago if they ever wanted to be a blue blood um you know so it's it's one of those where i don't think any cyclone fan can reasonably like say oh well we need to be we need to be winning big 12 titles every single year we need to be like getting ready to push for the playoff and all this or whatever like I would say it is a good enough program. Matt Campbell's a good enough coach. They'll have him. He'll have them in position to win a conference title once in a while, or you know, especially in an expanded twelve-team playoff. He'll have them in position to maybe sneak in as an at-large, you know, once every you know once every five years or something like that or whatever. It's a good enough program to do that. Am I gonna lose sleep because they don't get to the playoff three years in a row? Probably, probably not. <laughs> I'm gonna go and I'm gonna continue to tailgate with my family and my friends and have a good time. <laughs> So. Levi Stevenson, wide right, natty light. It's on SP Nation, Iowa State Athletics right there. Please join him, and Levi will be knocking on your door here in the next few months. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to it. This is going to be – it's a, it's an interesting season. This Iowa State got a decent schedule for the for the first year in the expanded Big 12. I think there's a, there's a, there's a lot of wins on that schedule to be had, and I think they could – this is a team that could surprise a lot of people. I I really do. I mean, like we're in spring. I have no idea, but nobody has any idea about their team. Uh, but just you know, going off paper and going off last season seems to believe. Seems to me that Iowa State. I think their preseason they'll probably end up getting picked like somewhere between five and seven. I would guess. I think they should probably be higher than that, especially with the schedule they they got. Okay, Levi, we appreciate you being here, man. Thanks for having me. Have a good night. Thanks. All right, let's keep it rolling here with the Voice of College Football. As we mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, Notre Dame uh, on the field in South Bend. You may have caught it on Peacock. We've got Nick Shepkowski here from Irish Wire. How you doing, Nick? Good. Thanks for the invite as always, Mark. How are you? Oh, well, thank you for stopping by because otherwise we're a bit void on Notre Dame uh, feedback from today, and we look forward to what you have to say. Uh, D Rock Irish uh, just dropped CJ Carr's stat line in the chat, so I guess we can start there. Quarterback play on this fine, blustery afternoon, I assume, in South Bend, like the rest of the Midwest. Yeah, windy, um, cold, 
Sun did show up for a little bit of the game, though. Wasn't expecting that early on, but it did end up showing up. Yeah, quarterback's a good place to start. Um, I think you look at the stats, and I think you see uh, C.J. Carr, the freshman quarterback, played for both squads, got some reps for both squads there. And overall, I mean, you look at it, the gold team goes 20 of 32 passing. The blue team goes 24 of 35 passing. They combined for over 500 yards. They throw four touchdown passes. Um, things went pretty well in the passing game when you look at it statistically. I think there are a couple things, though. Riley Leonard did not play in this game. Um, still coming back from he had a surgery, another procedure done on his ankle at the start of spring this year, so he did not play in this one. And I think the thing you kind of look at with this isn't so much the stat lines. It's more so kind of look, the overall look and the overall feel. And you can see the inexperience. Um, I put in my post after the game, Steve Angeli, he had a great game, phenomenal game against uh, Oregon State in the Sun Bowl this past year uh, to conclude the 20 and 20, uh, 2023 season. And it's his numbers were great, had a phenomenal day, nothing against him, but in all honesty, with what had left Oregon State because of the mass exodus through the transfer portal, because of them leaving, um, and the Pac-12 dissolving, you could argue he played against a better defense today, even if the defense wasn't uh, wasn't exactly scheming and game planning necessarily. And he looked slow in his reads. He looked uh, oftentimes uh, a lot of passes thrown behind. Um, didn't necessarily look comfortable. Now, is that credit to a defense? Sure. Is that credit to... Um, not necessarily credit, but as part of the reason for that, getting in rhythm with some younger receivers, some guys all playing together for the first time, that's certainly probably the case too. But I think you do walk away from this. The athleticism from Kenny Mitchie, he's going to be a sophomore this year, was a heavily recruited guy that Notre Dame actually stole from Pitt, stole the commitment from Pitt late in the 2022 season it was. Um, his athleticism was on display. Again, when he gets outside of the pocket, dangerous on his feet. Obviously, the, the inexperience showed itself. He threw an interception. He could have thrown one more um, in that contest. And CJ Carr is probably the one you look at and say, well, yeah, he probably looked like he was not necessarily the best quarterback, but might have looked like the guy that had the highest ceiling of, of the three because it's – you just kind of see those quick release type of guys, the guy that can just get the ball out and it seems like they put no effort in whatsoever and can throw a deep out. And it's like, that was CJ Carr today. And it's been a long time since Notre Dame's had a guy that can consistently do that. Not to say that Carr is at that level yet, but he certainly looks like a guy that can grow into, into that kind of quarterback. So we don't have a quarterback competition, correct? No, I, I think as long as Riley Leonard is healthy, He's easily your starting quarterback. Now, I will say, it hasn't gone well for Riley Leonard so far. I mean, he spent most of the spring in a walking boot. So there is that. And there's, I, coming off of the injuries he had last year, really it started in a Notre Dame game. Um, Duke had Florida State on the ropes down in, um, down in Tallahassee last year until Leonard exited that game. And it's just, okay, I still think that he's going to be the opening day starter, but so far it's just kind of been a little speed bump here, a little speed bump there. A lot of time to go still before um, before we get to the, the opening kickoff, the opening game against Texas A&M the last weekend of August. But I will say it's just it's one of those things. Just kind of maybe keep keep an eye on just a little bit. Assuming he's healthy, he's going to be the starter, but just keep an eye on it just in case type of thing. I do think though. Um, if that becomes the discussion, I think that race for the number two spot is very interesting and very much open. And I, and after seeing Carr perform today, I, I, I don't think he'd enter the year as maybe your backup quarterback, but man, he, he certainly has the potential that he could be knocking on that door by, by mid season, by late season. Nick Shepkowski's here breaking down the Irish for us, a Notre Dame spring game in the books. You can catch Nick's work at uh, Irish Wire ND. You'll see the uh, information there on the banner. And uh, Fisherman's asking about Notre Dame's offensive line. Yeah, if today's any indication, uh, not good. You do have to remember Notre Dame does have probably one of the better defensive lines in the country. 
And also when you're replacing like Joe Walt, we're going to see his name called probably in the first seven or eight picks um, next Thursday night in the NFL draft. He's going to be a first round top 10 pick almost assuredly. Blake Fisher is going to hear his name called in the middle rounds as is the other tackle in that. And I think, I guess the thing you take away from, from looking at the spring game in this, like Charles Jaguash, um, he was a five-star recruit, was a top recruit two years ago, uh, entering his sophomore year. And Jagasaw, I'm sorry, um, out of Rock Island, Illinois. And he started the bowl game, started a little slow in that bowl game, but played rather well, like most of Notre Dame's team did against Oregon State. Uh, today you saw him a little bit against Notre Dame's defensive line, and that was a little bit of growing up uh, growing up in a, in – with 31,000 or so eye pairs of eyeballs on him. Um, it, was, it was a learning process there a little bit. And it ended up getting better, I think, as the game went on. But there was a little bit there, like uh, R.J. Onye, um, the new court, uh, R.J. Ubin, rather. I'm getting all the defensive linemen. Jason Onye uh, both had pretty good showings against him. Um, I would say Notre Dame's defensive line I feel pretty good about. The offensive line, I guess when I evaluate it, I can't sit here and be like, oh, my goodness, it's it's panic mode and it's this and that. Because even with, okay, you're taking out two guys that are going to get probably top 100 picks in the NFL draft off of that line and then kind of split the line that's left over in half and then divide it amongst two teams. So it's, it's hard to look at it and be like, yeah, this offensive line stinks. But it is certainly one of those of – I know Notre Dame has quite the history of offensive alignment, especially in the last decade. But – it's not as simple as, okay, just take out a top 10 pick and instant re repla replace them type of thing either. I do think that there is going to be a setback there. Um, it's going to be up to the skill players to make up for that a bit. So, Nick, if you take everything that you know about Notre Dame football today after watching this game, after every bit of intel that you could take from the entirety of the other 14 practices and scrimmages and go back a month or so, do you have any different thoughts and feelings about this team and its capabilities? Are there any particular players or units that you've had a change of thought on? Well, it's interesting because like one of the things, the guy that I'm probably most interested in, at least offensively on this team, wasn't available today. And it wasn't because he was injured. It's because he had a lacrosse game this morning and wasn't going to pull double duty on the same day. And that's uh, Jordan Faison, the wide receiver, was a walk-on, was, was highly recruited in lacrosse. Played for the national champ or played for the um, national championship lacrosse team, or, or as I, I should say, they won that championship in lacrosse. He came in as a freshman as a lacrosse player and decided to walk onto the football team. Did that by midseason had earned a scholarship, and he reminds me of like when you, when you watch him, he reminds me very much of like, I mean. He was a Blitnikoff winner at Notre Dame, but like Golden Tate, just in how quick he is, but how well he controls his body of just like, there's one thing about being fast. There's one thing about being quick, but like when you have complete body control, Faison has that. And like, you can go look up his lacrosse highlights and it's absurd. It's like watching people trying to like swat at a gnat, trying to defend him. And that's what he looked like on the football field last year. I was excited to see him, but despite not being able to necessarily see him and he hasn't been in, in all the practices this year because he's busy scoring a goal a game in the lacrosse program that happens to be ranked number one. But I look at the wide receivers and really the overhaul that they're kind of doing there. The biggest name, at least this spring, has been a guy that started last year pretty strong, dealt with a hamstring injury about the end of September, and didn't have the greatest finish of years. Came on a little bit stronger towards the end of the year, but name is Jaden Greathouse to keep an eye on. Uh, Notre Dame fans are going to be familiar with him. Scored two touchdowns in the opener last year against Navy. Um, was actually the first Notre Dame player to, I believe, ever do that, receiving-wise anyway. Um, and that's kind of your Jason Garrett. A lot of Notre Dame fans, not a huge fan of him in the booth, but I think he did make an interesting comparison today during the game. Um, when you kind of look at a body like the, what Jaden Greathouse is, 6'3", close to 200 pounds, you kind of think, okay, well, that's not really the type of guy that you're going to put in a slot type of deal, but that's exactly what Notre Dame was using him as quite a bit today and it, what they probably plan on doing. And Mike Denbrock, the new offensive coordinator that 
has been at Notre Dame two times before, is back for a third run, this time call and play, is fresh off of uh, leading LSU to a historic offensive season and one that saw a Heisman Trophy won by their quarterback, Jaden Daniels. There's a lot of excitement and a lot of curiosity of what this offense is going to look like. And so far, I think what's interesting is Denbrock has said a lot of, okay, yeah, this is what I did, and this might have been what I won with and, and played very well with with LSU last year, but you have to play at the players that you have. And when you look at Notre Dame, they've recruited a lot of the same way that they have done traditionally. They still have very good tight ends. Uh, Mitchell Evans, the one that was Notre Dame's leading tight end a year ago, got hurt late in the season, tore an ACL, was not available today. But you look on it, at it, and a guy that was has battled injuries or so, but his name, uh, Eli Raritan, stepped in, and he had a very good showing today. Scored the first touchdown of the game. Um, and it just kind of looks like one of those of it's kind of it, – it, things things are different, but they're also going to still kind of be the same uh, for Notre Dame as well because it's going to be heavy heavy influenced by the tight ends. Um, I see that Michael's putting the comment up there about Micah Gilbert. Yes, the five receptions, 79 yards, two scores, had the big uh, long touchdown Hall as well. It's an exciting player to keep a name on or keep an eye on. I do. I am curious of, like, I feel like last year it was just like Tommy Wright, Tommy Reese light was kind of what you'd call the offense or kind of what the design was. And that's, if you know, Tommy Reese and how he was received in South Bend, there were some things that were like, Oh my goodness, this guy is a genius. And there is a good chunk of what in the world is going on here. Jared Parker was a lot like that last year, and I think there's a lot of faith and a lot of confidence that Denmark's going to bring something that's that's a lot more potent and a lot more modern than Notre Dame's seen in quite some time offensively. Nick, before we let you go, of course, the talk of college football outside of what may happen down the line, we will leave that for further uh, conversations in regards to all sorts of Super Leagues and contraction and everything else because Notre Dame is, of course, safe and sound. Uh, looking at the transfer portal, which, of course, runs through April 30th. Uh, we just outlined a loaded quarterback room with some very talented players that you got to think, do we expect one to say, hey, I'm four deep on this depth chart, uh, it's time to take off, or is there enough inexperience there for them to be thinking, okay, well, uh, I can wait here and any other initiatives with the transfer portal targets and so forth that you see playing out. I mean, it's certainly it's the first place that I think I would look is it would make all the sense because again, assuming health with Riley Leonard, maybe that's a dangerous thing. Maybe it's not, but you, if you pencil him as your starting quarterback and then there's kind of that competition that you look at and it's for, for Notre Dame there, is it Kenny Minchie? Is it the younger guy or is it Steve Angeli who played well in the bowl game? And, a lot of people are rooting for to kind of win that second job. I don't think anyone's going to expect CJ Carr to, to, to leave Notre Dame. The expectation wasn't going to be for him to play entering his freshman year as it kind of was, but to have, it, it's kind of a first world, first college football world problem for Notre Dame right here. And that's not something that you can say about their quarterbacks recently. It, not that they've had bad ones, but the depth of the position has not been, it's like an Ian book injury away. And while that team would go from being a college football playoff contender to maybe a seven and five type of squad, um, the depth was not there. And I think it speaks volumes, but I think you're right. I think that it does make a lot of sense to, okay, which one of those two in Angeli and Minchie doesn't get that second job or that second spot in the quarterback depth chart. That one would make a heck of a lot of sense to, to, to kind of think like, all right, well, playing time might not be coming here. Um, they have a very highly recruited quarterback coming in in the next class as well, Deuce Knight out of Mississippi, who was on campus today trying to do some recruiting for that very highly thought or highly thought of class as well that's starting to be compiled by Notre Dame. So I I tend to think like the biggest one would be a quarterback. I mean, we saw it a year ago. Tyler Buckner left, um, ended up going to Alabama trying to get some playing time there. I think that I think you're going to see a good number of departures just because that's what college football is anymore. Um, I think it's safe to say, like, all right, a week from now, we're probably looking at it, and there's 10 or 11 guys that are in the portal and exiting, and maybe a handful more guys ended up coming in. But that's just kind of the world we live in now. In terms of predicting those, I I don't know. Maybe, maybe a quarterback tries to uh, – sticks around and tries to win out in the fall competition. I'm not sure, but – but yeah, it's going to be almost certain that we see see a good chunk of departures just because that's the world we live in these days. 
Nick Shepkowski, Irish Wire ND. You see the X handles slash Twitter handles right there with Nick and both uh, Irish Wire ND. Nick, we appreciate you answering the call. I was desperate for Notre Dame uh, <laughs> information and a take from you. So thank you so much for stopping by and taking some time out of your schedule tonight. Absolutely. Appreciate the invite as always, Mark. Thanks, Nick. Have a good night. Right, have a good night. We keep it rolling here at the Voice of College Football. Next up, we're going to talk some Texas. We're going to talk some Illinois as well. And uh, in the meantime, let's get to some super chat contributions. We've got Drew Fitz, who says, now understand, this is not coming from me. Some people have baited me into this comment from time to time. And it's only been in quotes. I am quoting the super chat here. Go blue. That end quote. Okay. Jackson Johnson. Jackson, we appreciate you. Uh, sorry I didn't see this or get it uh, online before while Levi Stevenson was here talking Iowa State, but Jackson letting us know here. Iowa State's last conference title was back in 1912 in the, uh, what was that, the MWC, uh, that's the, uh, I am losing it because I've always known what that stood for. That's the Midwest Valley Conference. No, that's not quite right. Anyway, I, I'm not going to replace any other knowledge in my head and brain cells with looking that up uh, because that was in 1912. The Missouri, thank you, Will. That's exactly what it is. And I knew exactly, I was thinking Midwest, I was thinking Mountain, and I was like, neither one of those are correct. That's it. Which, of course, uh, also was able to survive as a basketball conference. So that's that's why I've been able to keep that up. Uh, Troy, that is that is a that you hit the nail on the head. I could not have said it any better than that. So again, in quotes is what was stated there. So I am merely quoting someone else. Troy, thank you so much for that. And uh, by the way, if you want Michigan spring game coverage over on the Michigan channel, we went for two and a half hours on the maize and blue. So check it out. Here we go. We got Sonny Verma on the line. You can catch him on the Illini cast. You can also catch him on the Big Ten show. That's a channel right here on YouTube dedicated to Big Ten football coverage. That is exceptional. And of course, right here at the Voice of College Football on our Texas channel. So, Sonny, you're a fairly busy guy here. <laughs> I was going to say, Mark, it's been a pretty busy day for me. But you know what? Uh, it's been a while since I got to watch a little college football. So even though it wasn't quite the real thing, it, it was close enough for me. Well, I tried to catch up on Illinois by listening to Brett Bielema give his yeah. post-game comments. And I got to say, I, I give me some Brett Bielema. I can listen to the guy all day. Usually has some very interesting things to say. I've always admired Brett Bielema. Thought he got a raw deal at uh, Arkansas, but he gave the standard lines. Everybody's progressing. Everybody's developing. Everybody looks good. And, and so that's what it was uh, in regards to the quarterback situa situation. Luke Altmeyer, 10 of 14, couple touchdowns, 116 through the air. Donovan Leary, 13 of 23 for 207. So I guess we'll start right there because, of course, Luke Altmeyer is a former four star and uh, much is expected of him and his continued progression uh yeah i mean we might as well start there because that was kind of all that we have to talk about uh when it comes to the spring game today uh as an illinois fan there was a couple questions that you kind of had uh which we considered strengths coming in which was the quarterback position and the running back room and uh, i guess the offensive line and watching this game that just Today just all kind of confirmed that. We knew, Luke, again, the Illinois fans were confident in Luke Altmaier's abilities because we saw what happened. Um, Non-Illinois fans, you know, saw John Paddock overtake Luke, and it may have looked a little worse than it really was. Luke was playing just fine as a quarterback. It just so happens that John Paddock went on a complete ringer, like he was just on fire, and uh, Brett Bielema, who was trying to make a bowl game, uh, almost had no choice. It, it would be hard to bench a guy who just threw for five, what well, two games prior, uh, had a game winning drive. And then the previous game had a 500 yards, uh, for a victory over, uh, I, sorry, I recall, I don't recall who it is, but Minnesota. it's hard to bench. 
what was that? Minnesota. Minnesota, uh, Minnesota was a drive that oh, had that's right. at the last drive. Indiana yeah. wasn't it Indiana. The, it might have been Indiana. Uh, yeah, yard uh, game. My yeah. memory fails me right now, but um, yeah. So again, uh, from the outside, you know, it seems like Luke Altmaier got benched, but it wasn't so much he got benched as much as John Paddock. It's just like you gave him the keys because he was just. Uh, you know, again, I'm a little older, so I don't know where your viewership falls. But for me, it reminded me of when Kurt Warner replaced Trent Green in the NFL, uh, you know, a couple of decades back. And it was a backup who who was very unassuming, but all of a sudden kept throwing for 300, 400 yards. And you're just wondering who this guy is. And that was kind of uh, who John Paddock uh, ended up being. So um, this upcoming year, our uh, quarterback room, seems pretty solid for us. Like I've been very confident in Luke Altmaier becoming last year was his first year as a full-time quarterback. Um, this is the first time Brett Bielema is going to have a quarterback returning as a starting quarterback. And he could have, you know, fished the transfer portal if he didn't feel confident in Luke's abilities. And let's be honest. And I know you've been a very vocal component about this. If, Luke Altmaier was like a lot of other college players right now. He could have fished for other opportunities at this point. He he was a four star, as you mentioned. He could have easily been like, look, I was playing fine. And this coaching staff decided to go with someone else. It could have been very easy for Luke to all of a sudden decide, hey, I'm going to enter the transfer portal and I'm going to try to find other opportunities and play for a different team and, you know, cash in on whatever paychecks. But he didn't. And uh, this offseason, Brett's been very vocal about that. Like uh, Luke, he's been very supportive of what he, the decision that he saw the coaching staff make last year. He learned a lot from John Paddock. Uh, you know, he was very supportive of him uh, throughout. And he knows what his faults were last year, which were kind of, he was a little more indecisive. He, held on to the ball maybe a split second too long, whereas John Paddock, uh, when he was in the game, when, uh, when you account for his stat, uh, snaps, like his release was as high as any, like um, from rele from snap to release was uh, as quick as any quarterback in the Big Ten. Luke's wasn't. And so he's like, you know what? I realized that I've that's something I have to work on. And the beauty of, beauty of all this is Luke's got three more years of starting if he wants to. And uh, so that that's a room that we always thought we'd be pretty confident in. And uh, the other one was his backup. You know, as you kind of mentioned, Donovan Leary. College football fans know the Leary name because his older brother it was a very good quarterback for, uh, he just played for Kentucky. And it, Devin Leary uh, is who I'm referring to. He's got the genes and he also had a very solid showing today uh, in the spring game. And so for us, it was very comforting that Leary and Altmaier looked very well. You talked about seeing that Bioma press conference. Um, our secondary is going to have to, you know, fix a few things. And so there's not much to focus on on the defensive side uh, at this point. What we're hoping for uh, coming into the season is a strong quarterback room, a strong running back room, and a strong offensive line. We saw all three of those today. Defensively, we didn't see quite as much, but I don't know if that's just kind of by design because we had a couple guys in the secondary leave us. And uh, now the transfer port is open. We're definitely going to be making a strong run towards, you know, shoring up that defensive side. So, Sonny, is this a bowl team? Is that the uh, aspiration? Obviously, the schedule, which I've looked at in the past, I can't recall it at the top of my head. You know, I, I, I actually think this is the big shame about all of this realignment, among other things, is that this program just didn't win a Big Ten West title couple years ago, but most observers thought they were the best team, including myself. I thought they were the best team in the West that year. Things didn't break the right way. And now there's virtually no chance of ascending to that level, uh, but that's what it is. So you have to readjust the expectations and the hopes. 
I mean, you're exactly right. It's uh, we had our chance, you know, two seasons ago. That uh, our over under in Vegas is five and a half, and I'm one of the more optimistic Illinois fans you're going to find uh, on whether it's social media or YouTube or whatnot. Even right now, I'm. If you asked me two weeks ago, I would have leaned over, but we have two weaknesses coming into this upcoming year. And uh, one of them was our defensive line, where I think we legitimately have the guys there, especially some of the guys that we got in the transfer portal. And our secondary, where we didn't necessarily have the guys, and I was kind of hoping that we'd be able to shore up with the transfer portal. But all that's happened is we've lost arguably one of the three best guys that we had in Zachary Tobe. Uh, He's going to leave us. And our defensive backs coach, uh, unfortunately, who was just hired, Brett Bielma just had to replace uh, the guy from the previous year because because our secondary was pretty bad last year. Um, so he had to re- replace our defensive backs coach. And the guy we just hired in about January was just, he just decided he had some medical conditions. He didn't decide. Life decided he had some medical conditions. And so um, he is no longer employed with the University of Illinois. So Brett has decided that he was going to wait until after spring practices to replace him. Now, when it comes to college football quarter or college uh, coaches, Brett has as much of a Rolodex as anybody. Uh, He's been in the game a very, very long time. And unlike uh, his predecessor, predecessor, Lovey Smith, who, you know, hired a his son as a assistant coach, you know, who was probably a little underqualified, let's put it kindly. Brett kind of has his choice of whoever he wants to hire. And he's been, he's made it pretty clear that despite it being late in the coaching hire cycle, um, he's had a few candidates who are excitedly reaching out for this position. But the fact that the secondary was already weak coming into the spring game, and one of the main concerns that we've had coming into next year. And now we've lost arguably one of our best guys in the secondary. And now literally the coach who's coaching up that secondary. I'm at the point now where, you know, I'm not as confident as I was before that we'd make a bowl game. Right now, the aspirations, that's it. Let's get us to six wins. I know our defense is young. You know, obviously we're losing Johnny Newton, Keith Randolph. Um, a, a couple guys on defense this year, the year before we lost three guys in the top 70 picks in the NFL. So Illinois is not a program that's built to just next man up. Uh, Illinois is a, you know, and Brett Bielma in particular is a program builder where it takes a couple years to a couple, you know, recruiting cycles to have the guys ready to play. I don't know if the guys are necessarily ready yet on the secondary side. So, I guess we can revisit this conversation in a couple months once I see what that roster looks like. But uh, as of now, if I was in Vegas and I saw that number at five and a half, I'd say that's just about right. Mm, Yes. Uh, If anyone's familiar with uh, Johnny Newton, and if you're not and you're a big college football fan, you probably just missed him because you weren't watching Illinois. Because if you turned on a game for more than like two series, he was at some point going to just jump off the screen even if you're watching the ball i understand most people are watching the ball but there's sometimes a where a defensive player is just so outstanding for some reason and he's one of those guys that um, i discovered fairly early on a few years ago and uh wow just a force just a force and you put um randolph into that equation as one of the top players at his position in the big 10 and those are losses that this type of program doesn't typically recover from. So that's tough. All right. We got Sonny Verma here. You can catch him on the Illini cast, uh, tracking his beloved uh, Illinois football team. And then on the voice of college football on our Texas channel. So we've got a Texas live show that we launched uh, last Monday with Matthew Miller. You can catch us every Monday at 7 PM Eastern time. We'll be back on the national channel, but yes, That will be exclusive to the Texas channel here very soon. So please subscribe over there. Sonny will be providing some Texas content for it. And 
Sonny has been an outstanding quick study on Texas football. Now we're going from Illinois with one level of expectation, and I don't know that we can find too many programs that supersede the expectations at Texas this year, and in particular one Arch Manning. And then after today, I got to (laughs) think, as soon as Quinn Ewers lets one hit the ground, uh, half the stadium is going to be clamoring for Arch Manning. So, Mark, I both the Texas spring game and the Illinois spring game were on at the same exact time. So I had one on my TV and one on my iPad, and I couldn't tell that both sports, like they were playing the same sport. Like I couldn't even believe it. Uh, you know, Texas has been talked about having the best, best uh, quarterback room in the country, and I think after – today that there can't be any doubt um there was it was known that Quinn Ewers was not going to play very much today so like his numbers really didn't matter but I mean Arch Manning came in and throw in his first throw through a 75 yard dart for a touchdown he ended up with 19 out of 25 with uh 355 yards three touchdowns and The third string guy, Trey Owens, who, uh, believe it or not, you know, everyone knows Quinn Ewers from a couple years ago. He was the big name, you know, the guy, uh, the number one prospect who signed with Ohio State, but then went back to Texas. It was a big deal back then. And then the biggest name is Arch Manning, which even non-college football fans uh, will recognize that name. Arch Manning showed up. But then we have this freshman named Trey Owens who, you know, again, as I'm trying to get, you know, uh, associated with the Texas community, they keep mentioning this name to me. This guy had 14. He was 14 out of 21 for 220 yards and three touchdowns himself. And like I'm, I'm I saw three quarterbacks today who, in my opinion, could have started for 110 teams in the country. And it's one of those uh, surpluses that you know, the team in Austin just is, has a luxury to have. And, uh, you know, they're very fortunate moving forward to that. You know, again, Quinn, I think Quinn is easily the guy. Uh, let me eliminate the, I think portion. He is the guy, this is third year starting, but Texas is one of those teams that should something happen to their starting quarterback, um, compared to the other teams that are contending, not just contending, contending for a national championship. I think Texas is as well prepared as anybody in the country to, you know, continue moving forward to try to win a championship, even if their number one goes down. So again, Sonny, I'm quite impressed with, of course, you're a enormous college football fan to start with. So it's not like, uh, you're not able to hold down these conversations regardless, but we, we stay in uh, frequent contact and, you have done a cram session on Texas football over the last month or so. Uh, So not just taking into account what you read or what you watched today and followed up on, but in regards to uh, the entirety of this team, their ability to compete in the SEC, what else do you think is either just over the top outstanding or could be a concern or a key to this Texas season? I mean, they've got the offense there. I think literally from the research I've I've seen and what they're basically going to focus on uh, this transfer portal season, and they've got a lot of visitors coming up that were there for the spring game. And should any of them commit, you know, subscribe to this channel. I'll have a video up uh, almost immediately talking about them. But they need at least one or two guys on the defensive line. Is the line good enough to win a national championship? Probably. But is uh, Coach Sark comfortable with probably? I don't think so. I think he has an expectation for the season that he wants to – he knows he's got the guys, he's got the dogs to win it all. So if that's the case, uh, he wants to make sure that there's no weaknesses. And so, I mean, I've heard the possibilities of two defensive linemen, and you're talking about like top-of-the-line guys committing this weekend, but Texas might take three. And – Texas is a team that, uh, since Sark has been in charge, has been recruiting very, very well. So it's kind of a big deal that, you know, you're potentially 
angering guys who are very highly rated five stars, four stars by taking guys essentially over recruiting them. But that just kind of shows you the culture that Coach Stark has now down in Austin that they're ready to win. You know, uh, there's the meme of, you know, is Texas back or not? They're ready to shed that. They're ready to show that last year was not a fluke, that right now they're not rebuilding. They're entering the SEC to be one of the big dogs and that they plan on being in the playoff again and they want to contend again. And for anyone who understands the money and the resources and the capabilities beyond the field that should translate to the field that Texas has not shown us for the last 15 years since Mac Brown was in his heyday, but then emerged last year, uh, the ability of this program to win and sustain elite play from year to year is really uh, arguably number one in the nation. Now that may seem ridiculous based on what some people, we just lived through the Saban era and what Alabama was. They were the gold standard. We know what Ohio state is. I would argue the most consistent elite program in the country for 20, 30, 50, 70 years. Uh, Georgia has been the most dominant from year to year over the last few years, four to five to six to seven under Kirby smart. But if you take the, just the, the recruiting base within the state, you take the money that is backing this program and all of that into consideration. Uh, it's a pretty uh, <laughs> awesome possibility of what could be accomplished there. I, I I agree. You know, it's one of those where there's a debate to be had and you, this could be one of those uh, off season topics you can, you know, tackle at some point. But I think when you talk about if every program can hit their absolute ceiling, who would come out on top? I think Texas has an argument as much as anybody. And, you know, granted, you know, other schools have some advantages. You know, the disadvantage Texas has is there's a lot of D1 solid schools in the state. But when you talk about NIL, when you talk about the fan base, the support, and just the football being played locally, I mean, it, it, it's hard for me, especially now that I'm kind of in that community, to argue against the Longhorns. So I would say that we saw an impact on Texas A&M football when they joined the SEC. Now, they didn't have, for whatever reason, the coach. The It just didn't work out in the same season. But we saw a flash of it under Johnny Manziel in 2012 when he won the Heisman. And they came reasonably close to competing for a national championship. That their... Their prominence at Texas A&M in the college football world, despite what their record is, is much larger than it was when they were back in the Big 12. And they were just kind of buried with Texas Tech and Missouri, and that's kind of where their status was. They are looked upon as, oh, well, they've got all this money. They're in the SEC. They can explode at any time. There's 100,000 people in the stands every week. And Texas is a higher version of that. Uh, you could argue in some instances, and it makes sense that going to the SEC hurts them because, of course, the competition is going to drag their record. But their transition is happening at the perfect time, both for what Sark is doing, uh, but also because of the 12 to 14 team playoff that we're going to see where you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be 11 and one. You can be nine and three, 10 and two, Texas, 10 and two safe, nine and three, put you on the border uh, that, that they can now, I think the sec becomes an advantage for them. I know that they missed on some players, uh, especially on the defensive side over the last 10 to 15 years, because uh, as the Big 12 got dragged worse and worse and worse in comparison to the SEC, most of your top players look at that as, no, I want to play on CBS, on the SEC, in the biggest games where this conference is largely ignored outside of the Oklahoma-Texas game. 
no, I'm going to play in the SEC. And that was almost, in a sense, the last barrier. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. You know, it's one of those where, uh, you know, the Texas A&M crowd, uh, even, even the Baylor crowd, you know, we, Texas was obviously at the top tier, but you had the argument against them. You're not playing in the top conference in the country. That no longer is an issue. You know, now, right now, uh, if you're playing in Austin, you are playing against the Georgia. So you're going to be playing against Florida. You're going to be playing against, you know, the Alabamas. And, you know, you would think like if there's a dip in recruiting, then, you know, Texas could kind of be humbled, but that's just not what's been happening. Uh, you know, this is, you know, Coach Sark, you know, he's kind of straightened things out for, you know, some of the issues that he had previously. And it looks like he's got that machine running. You know, everyone that I've talked to, uh, he's really established a culture where he's very comfortable where he's at. He, he talked about earlier this week uh, in a very popular interview that came out that he entertained the Alabama job for about 60 seconds. And then he kind of realized what he had going in Austin. And I kind of don't blame, him. you know, it, it, it's one of those where it's one of the teams I think, and, you know, for those who watch uh, are, are watching this um, and who are familiar with me uh, from the Illinois side, I just bought a home, which is going to be about 20 minutes away from the stadium. So I'm very familiar with the community at this point. And I'm telling you, I, I know what the vibes are like. I know how excited the people are, the community is. And it's one of those where, you know, right now in the short term, sure, it's just more let's win nine games, let's win 10 games. But truthfully, the expectations this year, you know, the, they have uh, the highest over under in the country this year. And that's including a game that they play against Michigan and a game that they play against Georgia. So the expectations are absolutely high. And after what I saw today from their backup quarterback, and their third string quarterback, I honestly don't see that those expectations going uh, down anytime soon. Sonny Verma joining us uh, again. You can catch Sonny's work on the Illini cast. Get out your notepad or whatever you keep notes on because it's a long list. You got the Illini cast for Illinois football, basketball, everything going on with Illinois uh, in those two sports. You've got uh, the Big Ten channel, which is a uh, solid venture here. So Sonny, we'll let you explain what's going on at the big 10 show right here on uh, YouTube. Yeah, we've got a line I cast as Mark talked about uh, that. I got, had my degree from the university of Illinois. So uh, I, that's kind of where I spend a lot of my time talking about Illinois football and basketball and all sports uh, to be honest uh, at big 10 show which a lot of you guys know Justin Adams, who is the Nebraska host of Voice of College Football. Me and him started that channel in about January. And our most recent episode has this gentleman right there, Mr. Mark Rogers, uh, who uh, we now had our highest viewed episode of all time. It's about to reach 14,000 views. So thank you, Mark. Uh, that channel is doing very well for itself. So um, yeah, just catch me in either of those chats. And right here, I'm also uh, now signed on to do Texas content, the Texas Longhorns for uh, Mark. And I'm super excited to do that because it's nice to actually be following a college football team that matters. <laughs> so your beloved Illini, you keep that special place for them. But then when you feel like being heard, not that you're not doing great work. And obviously with the basketball season that you just experienced, I know it didn't end in a good way, but. Uh, Illinois is certainly a prominent basketball program. So you get a nice run there and gained a lot of attention. So, yeah, no, I, I'm very lucky, you know, like, uh, again, you know, Illinois basketball is on a trajectory up, uh, Texas football is on a trajectory up. So I like to think of it that I have no off season. Awesome. Well, Sonny, thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you for being here. And again, between Sonny and, Matthew Miller and myself, uh, Texas content over on the Texas channel. So please join us there, folks. And we got our Texas live show every Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern time, 6 p.m. where it counts right there in Austin. All right. Sonny, thank you so much for stopping by, sir. Thank you, Mark. All right.
I am checking in with a few other contributors here at the Voice of College Football. A couple names and faces you will recognize, but uh, trying to see if they are able to stop by tonight. Uh, otherwise, we will check out the chat, and uh, we have reviewed Iowa State, Texas, Texas A&M, and uh, we have looked at Notre Dame as well. So uh, if you're joining us a little bit late, and uh, once this ends, you can go back and check out the teams that you missed. And uh, spring practice is almost over. Uh, next weekend's a pretty loaded Saturday as well. I know Nebraska is the headliner off the top of my head, but other teams in play, Oregon uh, also, and some others. So we will be back here next Saturday, of course, uh, to run through uh, all the big spring games. Uh, Washington's kind of the outlier. They're waiting until May 3rd until we see Washington on the field with Jed Fish and new quarterback Will Rogers and what I called the other day as, in a sense, the most unique team in college football. And it could be argued the most unique team in college football history in this way. New conference, new coach, new coaching staff, new quarterback, Two returning starters. This is a completely different football team. They might as well change their uniforms and come up with another color scheme at the University of Washington. Again, let that sink in. New coach, not a big deal. That happens all the time, of course. New coaching staff, that goes along with the new coach. New quarterback, okay, there's another layer there. But two starters coming back at the University of Washington, and they're in a new conference. I got to think that's unprecedented, unprecedented across college football. All right. We had an Ohio State, Michigan uh, video that we posted this week that got uh, a decent response. So I did promise to respond to all of those folks out there, which I will. But I believe I'm going to do that uh, directly. So I think we'll fire up a live stream and address that Ohio State, Michigan video. And uh, now it's time for me to kick into true off-season mode, past spring practice, and we'll look at the top 10 non-conference matchups for 2024. We will look at the under-the-radar matchups, the best of the bunch. We will look at program rankings. We gave you our complete 2023 final rankings list, but our 2024 rankings... And then we will also dive into all-time program rankings. So if you've caught us in the past when we have delivered our all-time program rankings, I'm talking about not just we're spitballing, oh, Alabama's probably number one and Notre Dame's probably number two and I don't know, Ohio State's number three. No, 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 no. We, we do it much more systematically than that. This is our approach basically here at the Voice of College Football concerning all of these topics is you take the numbers, you do an exhaustive rundown, review, analysis of the numbers, but then you put that into context. That's where the brain starts working. You can't just go strictly, oh, these are the numbers. They've got 16 national championships. They've got 11. They've got d d no. Oh, their winning percentage is this, and their winning percentage is that, and their winning percentage is this. That's you put all the numbers in the grinder, you put it all together, and then you use some common sense and some knowledge and some understanding of the sport and the context, and you put it all together. So we will deliver program rankings all time. And the list of items that we keep track of, all-time winning percentage, all-time AP rankings, meaning there is a point system that determines your status in the AP rankings. And some people may stop me right there and say, Mark, you're always dissing the AP rankings. Yes, I do. However, let's understand that there is a large scale of validity to the AP rankings uh, that if a team finishes number five in the country in the AP rankings, it's not like they were the 22nd best team in the country, that they are largely accurate 
there are exceptions, but in volume over a hundred years, close to it, what 1936 was the first pole championship, 1936, that in totality, the AP rankings are valid. They're valid. They're not perfect. They're valid. Nothing's perfect. So we look at top five finishes, top 10 finishes, top 25 finishes, AP poll points. We look at bowl games, bowl wins. Well, when you look at bowl wins, it's like, okay, bowl wins are one thing, but Ole Miss is constantly going to the Liberty Bowl throughout their history and winning games over Texas Tech and West Virginia. Okay, well, that's that's okay. Major bowl wins. Okay, who are you beating in bowl games? Uh, we, we go through the NFL in terms of first-round picks and overall draft picks. We go through uh, the award winners, not just the Heisman Trophy winners, the award winners at every position. And, of course, we go through conference championships as well. So it's an exhaustive rundown of the all-time teams and all-time rankings with these programs. And if we could get a little more sophisticated in the future, I would actually like to weight it. Meaning 2024 is weighted heavier than 2000, and 2000 is weighted heavier than 1970, and 1970 more so than 1950, and et cetera. And especially when we're talking about the outset of college football in the 1890s, should those games count? Yes, they were played. They should count. But are they as important or impactful as the games that were played five years ago? No, they're just simply not. So I'm sorry, your national championship in 1903 is not worth as much as a national championship played last year. Just not. All right. SEC dog is letting us know that. Uh, thank you so much for that. I think Mark does a great job of calling it like it is. I do my best. I do my best. I am waiting word on. Well, Tim's here. Tim, are you getting my text? There it is. Tim, if you want to jump on the line, talk to me, USC football. Let me know. You've got the the link, Tim. It's in your email. Also, we are hoping that Corey Brad is going to stop by and talk Iowa. And uh, those are my last two holdouts. And again, I've got a long list of topics to run down in May and June. And then once we hit July, then we gear back up for the season. Practice, predictions, positional rankings, breaking it all down. But for the next couple months, I'm going to play around with a lot of topics we've hit on in the past. And maybe I'll take a stab at what college football is going to look like in 10 years. All right, folks, uh, it appears as though that is the end of the line. I believe, I believe. What about Sparty? Drufus is asking about to Michigan State. Yes, Michigan State uh, played half a game. The other half, they just ran drills. And the offense beat the defense 31-24. Nate Carter, you're going to see a lot of him if you watch Michigan State this fall. He ran for a 48-yard touchdown run. He also had a receiving TD. Jalen Berger, I was a bit surprised this guy's still playing college football. Former Wisconsin running back who transferred to Michigan State a couple of years ago. He had a touchdown for Sparty today. Tommy Schuster, 75-yard touchdown pass to Nick Marsh. You've got uh, a new defensive coordinator there in the East Lansing and Joe Rossi, who, of course, did a fine job with Minnesota. Really a fine job. Look at Minnesota's defensive ranks in the Big Ten and nationally under Joe Rossi since he came to Minnesota in 2017. He had that job at Minnesota for seven seasons. That's a long tenure 
as an assistant coach these days in college football. But Joe Rossi now runs the defense with Michigan State. So that's what I've got on the Michigan State spring game. I did not witness that. In the past, I have watched as much spring football as anybody you're going to find. And based on circumstances and really not wanting to make a decision on what I'm going to do with the various television platforms and streaming platforms, I thought, you know what? I'm not going to force myself to buy Hulu or get cable or get this or get that or whatever. I haven't looked at it. I haven't had time to look at it. I will. Uh, and I've been very content without it, without television for the last five weeks. So I just figured, eh, I went over to a buddy's house and I watched the Ohio State game last Saturday. I went to same buddy's house uh, today and watched the Michigan game. But other than that, that's about it. That's why we rely on guys like Tim Prangley here, who was at the USC spring game today. Yeah, I was got to, how's it going? It's going Hopefully pretty Hopefully everything's well. working. My mic working? Yeah, you sound okay. good. You look good. Just wanted to check. Yeah, it was it was a nice fun day. Uh, got there bright and early. Uh, took lots of video, lots of pictures. I'm I'm just now realizing what it's like to go through a thousand pictures. So a thousand. Well, I mean, so some reverse, right? So divide that by like four or three. But yeah, a lot, a lot of pictures today. Still, you took two or three hundred pictures. Yeah, but I got to go through. Yeah, anyway. So a great game. Um, defense lived up to what they've been saying. One thing I really liked. So I asked Miller after the game. I, I said to him, hey, "You got a really unique perspective. You've now seen the you know from quarterback position. You've seen the defense last year, as opposed to this year. You you've seen the whole through the whole camp." And I asked him, point Blake, what, what's the difference? He said, well, there were a lot more wide open guys last year, meaning that, that through camp, what they've been talking about is that they, they've been really pushing consistency. Some of these teams, the, the Grinch defenses, is sure, they'd get lots of turnovers. They'd flash here or there, but they're just, and then the next play, they're giving up a wheel route to Vaki for 70 yards, you know, or, or something like that. It was, it's just, it was just a mess. Uh, you heard Doug Belk, who's a new cornerback coach, I asked him at practice, I said, what, you know, what over everything else, what are you looking for from your corner? Cause it's a pretty talented cornerback room. And he, he, he said, I'm looking for consistency. When you talk to Lincoln Riley about one of the new freshmen, like coming out of nowhere from St. John Bosco, Celis Williams. First thing he says, he, he's got an uncanny ability for a true freshman to, to be consistent. And not not give it the big play. You know, maybe not maybe not make every play. Maybe not be there. But he's not he's not giving up anything big. He's consistent. His bad plays aren't aren't catastrophic. And um, it, it's just it's just been a theme. I've seen. We don't get to see a lot of seven on seven. This is the first time we saw you know like with the bullets. And I do mean this in air quotes, right? It's this is not real football for a spring game. But the the defense. There, there's a lot of talent out there, uh, especially at the corner. We knew our safety room was going to be deep, but the the cornerbacks, they're all 6'2". They're all physical. Uh, and I saw, I think I counted like maybe two busted coverages the, the entire day. So, I mean, after watching USC's defense last year, it, it, it was, it's, it's quite a difference. It, it, was, it was a stark, marked difference. Uh, Cameron Fountain, the true freshman, and he, he was amazing. Um, the uh, defensive end. Kids just a monster, quick, uh, just got a, just quick get off, super strong. Um, we're, we Bear Alexander was in sweats; he did not participate. So now it's more. We thought it was more the you know the the mini camp holdout to get nil. Turns out maybe he was actually injured during this whole drama act, but he didn't participate. They did tackling on for some, but they did some thudding as well. Uh, Riley just basically said all the coaches got together and said. Hey, look, you know, our numbers are a bit weak right now. We don't, we don't want any more injuries. So they did pull it back a little bit. Uh, but the reason why they're banged up is because they've been going physical. He said our practices and our scrimmages have been full contact and we have been physical. It's a, one of the big things, themes as well they had is, was physicality because USC's defense was soft last year. So uh, again, physicality, 
and and consistency is what they're looking at. And if you're a USC fan or if you just watched USC football last year and watched the defense, you know this team needed physicality and it needed consistency. So, Tim, uh, you had a pretty good look at this football team today. That's awesome. So you can catch Tim's work at Trojans Wire, also Matt Zemick, and, of course, uh, they get together every Friday night here at the Voice of College Football on our USC channel for Conquest uh, Call-In Show. And then you get Tim, you get Matt, you get myself on Monday nights at 10 Eastern. That's at 7 Pacific time on Monday nights. So that's the next time we get together, uh, Tim, Matt, and myself, to break down USC football. Um, where, you know, when you, when you're down there on the field and you get to see the athletes up close, you mentioned the six, two cornerbacks, and that wasn't a thing largely for the last, you know, era of USC football. Uh, is there anyone who overly impresses you just from a physical standpoint, whether that's size, speed, athleticism, and again, folks, if you've never had the experience of standing on a uh, college football field or an NFL field, which uh, I've been fortunate enough to do, uh, you get just just the violence of the game, the athleticism, the size of these guys. All of that just is is pretty remarkable. It's almost like if anybody's ever watched hockey on TV, and then you go to your first hockey game, you actually see that these these huge dudes on ice and how quickly they move. It, it's it's kind of like it's, it is kind of marked. That's that's the first thing I can think of. It, it reminds me of is is you just don't realize how big and how fast these guys actually are when you watch it on television. And we were up close. You're not in the stands. You're like right there on the sidelines. You you actually see the impacts and you see how quickly they move. This is the small the small movements, right? That burst, that get off we're talking about, and you know on the line, the the way these guys. That's why there's just so few of them that are 305, 310 pounds but move like they're 260, 270, you know, 250. That's that's a, a, a crazy thing to see up close and in person. Um, Zachariah Branch is just a freak. I mean, he, he is, he's zero to 60. He's like a Dory Jackson. He's like Reggie Bush. He's, he's, he's like, I'm not saying he is or as good as, he has the potential to be. Uh, he said after the game today, he said that actually, yeah, uh, they, they, they hold, what do they call those things again? Anyway, um, they were like a vest. You know, and, and it tracks all, a lot of their, their physical stuff. Um, catapult. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Michigan, too soon. Right. They, they, they do that, that and, and they can tell how fast they are. And he was talking about his speeds and they've tracked him as, yeah. So when I asked him, are you faster? He said, yeah, I'm faster. So I think that that guy's faster is, is, is a great sign for USC as well. Um, as far as just big guys that are, that are amazing to watch, uh, like I said, that Cameron Fountain, he's a true freshman. Uh, he, he got around and chased a running back from the backside. Uh, on a remarkable play again the, the guy uh, is, is 6'6 256 but right? he doesn't run like he's 6'6 256 he's a he's a true athlete uh to carlos nicholson a yeah, transfer from michigan Michi uh, mississippi state sorry not michigan state mississippi state he uh six foot three 195 uh just with great hands uh there were three interceptions you know i'm sorry four interceptions on the day so you think oh wow the the the, the quarterback room is in trouble it was more just if you watch the game, physical press coverage, big difference from the from when we used to see the ten yard cushions we were seeing under Grinch. These guys are big, their athletes are up front, and and they're uh, they got their hands on uh, and and they're playing the ball. I mean, yeah, we'll see how it's called in the Big Ten, but you know they they weren't calling it. They, they had Pac twelve refs out, and believe me, if Pac twelve refs keeping the flag in their pocket, then it's it's probably not pass interference. So, but it was physical. It was physical. Uh, Deuce Robinson looks like he's taking a step up. He's a freak in, in size, and, and uh, he had a nice couple, couple nice passes. And the person I've been telling, if anyone's been watching our show, I've been talking to you guys about Makai Lemon. And he made a huge impression on me way back when he was at high school, at Los Alamitos High School, and, and he played uh, St. John Bosco at a playoff game. Uh, the guy, they got him playing in the slot, but he's just smooth. He, he he's, he's, I dare say, I think he's a more athletic uh Taj Washington. I'm one of the biggest Taj Washington fans out there. But that's what he kind of reminds me of. He just, he just seems like not as much in his actual play. It's just as his ability just to get open and, and to be that guy on third down or whatever. I think that he's going to be that guy. He's going to have, I believe, he's going to have a pretty prolific uh, season this year. So you don't know his name now. If you do follow 
Big Ten or USC football, you're going to know his name by the end of the year. Tim, who won the battle at the line of scrimmage? Was it generally the offense or the defense? It was the offense, I think. And I remember Bear, Bear wasn't playing. Um, he was out. Uh, and and they lost rakes. So that was almost to be... Per, but here's the good thing. Um, we knew the left side of the offensive line was going to be solid and strong. Um, but Mason Murphy, a, a much maligned uh, offensive lineman, he's played all along the line for USC. Uh, but he's he's got a lot of crap from from the fans. Six five three twelve. He he he's he's still relatively he's a redshirt junior, but he doesn't have a lot of experience. As he's getting this experience with Henson, he's made some jumps last year. And then a couple of players, uh, Jonah Monheim for one, talked about how he he made a leap this year uh, as far as just ability and, and, and able to play. So uh, I like that. I like the true freshman um, uh, Brian Jackson running back. Phenomenal. Quinton Joyner, another guy I'm high on, a uh, guy that a lot of people don't know. Uh, just amazing. Popped a run. I um, thought he was going to be gone. They're doing thudding. I think if they had to actually tackle him, he would have been gone. Um, yeah, lots to, lots to, I mean, as much as you can pull from a spring game, Mark. I mean, who knows? Especially also it's not full tackling what a lot of these plays would have looked like in an actual game. Uh, but the offensive line, and I, I like this. Like, another thing, if you watch USC football last year, the right side of the offense, if you watch especially the Notre Dame game, or if you watch the Washington game, the right side of USC's offensive line was absolute, just bad. Uh, it looks like they've shored that up a bit. It, it really did because USC does have some pretty good defensive ends. I'm not, you know, I, they're not the the greatest ever to play, but they are solid. They they are going to give people fits, and USC's offensive line was able to hold them in check. The inside of the line, uh, again, because of injury and because of Rake's departure, uh, they do need to they do need some depth on on defensive tackle. Um, for sure, nose tackle especially. Tim Prangley, Trojans Wire. And uh, you heard Tim say he took two or 300 pictures today, so you will see the best of the bunch there at Trojans Wire. So get over there for that. Also, Tim's perspective on what he saw at the spring game. And, uh, of course, Matt and Tim on a regular basis covering USC football. So that's on Trojans Wire. And, of course, Mondays and Fridays on the USC channel, with Tim and Matt or Tim, Matt, and myself, Mondays, Fridays. So our next stop is Monday. So be there at 7 Pacific time. Yeah. And then so the all-time rankings, Mark. Yes. I want, we we got to go over this again. We always oh, do this. I, I would, I, I'm petitioning. Yes. Because I know you, I, I heard you roll over the whole bowl game thing. Yes. And I, and I heard you bring up the AP poll, which is yep. true. I like the fact that you do recognize the fact that it's over – a, a a long period of time but then uh, decades of that is in the 30s and in the 40s and in the 50s you know yes. that that a lot of those numbers were were compiled um as yeah, well as a number of the national championships what's that it's an all-time ranking it's an all-time ranking but then it, if you're going to call it an all-time ranking i'm not sure if you can give weight to the more recent one because that would say the more because then i agree then it would be a ranking of the most relevant teams there but if you call an all-time ranking and then apply more juice to the last couple of years, I'm not sure if it's an all-time ranking anymore then. Okay. My, my point was that, first of all, I don't have the resources to do that. Or I'm not going to grind myself <laughs> to a frazzle by doing it, you know, by hand. So that's not going to happen. I just said that I think there would be some validity to, first of all, you have different stepping points. You have different drop-off points, like the AP poll and the UPI poll. The poll champion started in 1936. Before that, teams were just kind of claiming their own national championships. So that was another level of credibility that at least there was a governing body of sorts, sports writers who were, declaring the national championship. Then of course that became more and more refined through the years. And there were more games played there. there you got to think that a national championship played in a 12 game regular season is more valid than one that's played where there was a seven game regular season in 1925, mm -hmm. uh, just because you're playing more teams. And you look at some of these schedules. If you want to go far back into the early 1900s, you had, 
schools, Minnesota winning a national championship. And you look at this and you see that yeah. three of the teams are basically like high school or club teams. Um, so it's, it's, there's no way to refine that perfectly. And of course, then there was segregation and desegregation, which is a demarcation of allowing all the great athletes to play and everyone gets a shot and opportunity. So there's a level of credibility there, but was there a Jackie Robinson moment? No, there's not. There is, it was at different times at different magnitudes all over the country. So there's no way to say, boom, 1965. This is right. No, it was at different times. Yeah. I mean, platooning scholarship limits, there's all different things that really shaped and changed yes. The sport. I, I get you. I'm just saying in the wording, if if we're going to you know make one era more important than the other era, we I don't know. I, I, I'm just saying I'm putting it out there. Can we really call it an all time ranking? That's all I'm saying. And I know you're not going to do it, but that was that was my that was my two cents. Uh, and my other two cents would be is I, I, I also think the bowl records to me, your bowl record is far more impressive overall. I mean, again, you can bring up some exceptions, but I think bowl records. Again, we got an Ohio State fan. Are you with a USC fan? I'm gonna definitely go with the with the bowl the bowl record rate. And then I think your guys like you and Michigan both have sub 500 bowl records, right? I mean, that's got to mean something. Well, what matters to me first and foremost is how worthy are the opponents. What's the level of and over the last. 30 years specifically, well, even way beyond that, uh, Ohio State's playing a top five team in the country every postseason. Mm -hmm. They just are and have been for a long time. Now, that doesn't excuse losing, but my example was, I know that, I don't know what it is now, but at one point, Ole Miss had a really good bowl record. And if you look through their history from 1960 they they were a power in the late 50s they won a national championship in 1960 that old miss from then up until pretty much now they're they're barely ranked they're playing in independence bowls and liberty bowls and they're playing unranked teams and they've got a great bowl record well okay we'll give them some level of credit for that but we're not going to compare that to schools that play top five teams practically every year in bowl games. So I separated right. major bowl games from just overall bowl record. Right. And that, well, I mean, I, if there's an easy number for that, maybe you should do that. Maybe you should do the, the bowl, you know, the, the, what we called back in the day, the BCS bowls is then generally you're playing one of the better conference champions. You're getting champions head to head. I'm just saying it's so hard to do because, and it's impossible because it, and it's, it's great. You take it on, but, wins themselves again because teams don't play the same you just don't they don't play the same type of schedules schools like an ohio state or a michigan they play each other every single year you know or, or i mean i think about usc and, and who usc's played over the years every year they played notre dame every year and then they're obviously playing two or three good teams in the in the pac 12 and then in most years i mean since i've been alive we're playing oklahoma we're playing in alabama we're playing at texas we're playing Ohio State, or we're playing, you know, USC is always playing those type games. And then there's some people that just rarely will step out of conference and play that quality of a team. And so to put, so to look at the look at schedules um, as, you know, all and, and say, well, this team's won this many wins. I mean, if I were doing it and, and everyone has their own way of doing it, I would look at head to head. Head to head would, would almost trump. So when you get in that top 20 or so, you know the top 20. You know, actually, it's really easy to tell the top 10 programs of all time. I think it's pretty is a pretty good number. Sure, you might screw up 9 through 12 and some bubble team, whatever. Sure. But realistically, 10 teams are going to be pretty solid. Definitely the top 7 or 8 are going to be like almost lock solid. Yep. No one will disagree with those 8. They might put them in different orders. But then once you get down to that crunch there, I do think that your head-to-head -head records against each other, um, national championships and then big bowl games are really where I would put the majority of who are the greatest programs of all time, because as much as it is, it is for a long time that it was a, uh, a beauty pageant to win, you know, who's number one, same thing for, if we're doing the bowl, the, the polar, because if you get rank weeks at number one or weeks in the top 25, how bad Mark are the top AP polls, the first like 
five, six weeks of the year. You know, it's just, a, it's just they're throwing darts. No, 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 no. That doesn't count. That's not included. It's the, oh, it's the final, final ranking. It's, a, it's just the final ranking. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, never mind. Then the that, AP puts together a system in which they attribute points to the final rankings. So if you're 25, you get a one point. If you're 24, you get two points. If you're 20 and on down the line. And then it just now what that doesn't measure is you could be number 26 in the nation. So I say this all the time. People probably get tired of hearing it once we get into the season. But the AP and every ranking, they, they're not ranking 25 teams. They're ranking 37 one week and 41. They just choose not to put a number next to the mm. next team that's 26. There is sometimes less point difference between 26 and 25 than there are a number of teams within the top. They just choose to stop putting a number, but they're ranking more teams than that. But so in any given year, you've got teams that are basically just as good as numbers 25, 24, 20, probably in the 20 range or even higher that don't get ranked. But you would think over time that would somewhat even out. There are teams that get ripped off in particular years and they're nine and four and they finish number 27 in the country, but they're not going to get any points for that or any credit. Uh, but yeah, it's it's based just on that final ranking. And you're right. And there's enough of sample size that no one wishes that. So that I think that is a solid that's that is a solid predictor. But even then, there's regional bias over decades. I mean, there's all kinds of things that go into that. But I think overall, like you said, there's no clean, empirical way to do this. And I think you do a very good job of it. I would just like to see you put a little less emphasis on your overall, you know, your your wins and losses over the year. And people say, well, that's how you mark a team. It's about wins and losses. But we all know that not every schedule is the same. Not every conference is the same. Not every out of conference schedule is the same. And, and there are some repeat offenders that just simply never, never challenge themselves out of conference. And, and they've got some pretty good, they got some pretty good um, percentages out there. Well, let's, I, tell, I let's so. tell it like it is and offend some sec fans. So with the sec, they're out of conference games. It's not that they don't play very good non-conference games because they do. If we, if we go year to year and add up, who everyone in the Pac-12, the previous Pac-12 had played in the Big Ten and the SEC. The SEC is playing their fair share of difficult games. The problem is, is because they play four non-conference games, they're playing like complete nothings. Like where USC's playing Notre Dame in a given year. Let's throw somebody out that they've played. LSU Texas. next year. Let's say, let's LSU. Say, LSU. Uh, Notre Dame, LSU, and then the third one's usually like Fresno State. It's like somebody who's capable of a yeah. pretty good team. Well, Alabama's is more like Texas, UT Chattanooga, Furman, and Utah State. That's pretty representative of like an Alabama. So they do play one that's that's on par with, but then they have these three others that are just nothing. And it's not, and it's not even about wins and losses because now you can lose two games, and if you have that tough skills you're talking about, and you and you win some some games against ranked opponents, you can make the playoffs with two losses. But the difference comes is is when you get to those playoffs and you play those two more meat grinders. Not, it's not called meat grinders. Let's say two more physical games. Then you then it's the, again the game of attrition where you have guys hurt or guys playing banged up that are, can't take that week off and week. Was it nine or so or whatever ten to where they get a week off to play? You know, Citadel. You know, you you don't get that opportunity. And hey, no one ever said it's against the rules, so they've continued to do it, and and, and it's obviously worked out for them. But I just I'm saying you can't look at schedules, win, winning percentage, etc., because it's not apples to apples, and then and it's quite frustrating. Because one thing I've really enjoyed over the years getting to watch all these games, but also at the same time is is it really puts your team. At a, at a huge disadvantage, and not just in a win loss. You could win that game, but you could lose your starting left tackle for the last three or four games of the year instead of having that that game. You could stat half your team out because you're up, you know, forty two to three at halftime. So, and, and that's so big. what you're proposing, and I would add this to my 
rankings, if it was available, would be a strength of schedule. But that doesn't take into account exactly what you're talking about. That's completely, as you say, empirical. It's just can't be quantified. It would be impossible uh, to do that. But uh, the wear and tear on the team uh, because of those difficult games. Now, the SEC fan, and I believe this is completely valid, so I'm arguing both sides, can say we've been the best conference. Now, have they been the best conference for 100 years? No, they've been the best conference for 15 years. <laughs> so, uh, But they have been the best conference for 15 years. So you could say, well, our records got beat up and our players got beat up by playing the best conference because they have been the best conference. Yeah, they have been the best conference. No one, no one really argues that. But I mean, I don't know, Mark. I, I, I wouldn't. I don't even now. Like, oh, the, the Big Ten. Let's say the Big Ten becomes the best conference in in, in college football. I, you'll, you're not going to hear me banging my chest about my conference. I, I mean, I'm never going to do that. I, that's always been so weird to me to to do that. I, I, I've never understood it. Truly, I hate the other. You know, there's other teams. Like, so I hate such a strong word. I seriously dislike some of the context. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, yeah. the, there's, there's, I significantly yeah. dislike to an extreme level yeah. some of the programs. You hate them in a sports I, context. You don't hate them as people or want anything bad to happen to them, but you, I may hate, hate a couple. You hate them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so I mean, but this it just seems I'm sorry, it just seems phony to me. It seems like some bottom feeders are riding coattails, and it seems like uh you know, if well, we didn't win the championship this year, but we we play the toughest conference, therefore we we win something. No matter what, our second place team's the second best team in the country because we're the toughest conference. It's just that logic that got a little bit tired. But clearly, programs like Alabama and and uh Georgia have been a step ahead of everybody for at least the last six, seven years, you know, and Alabama going back even farther. So well, uh, I I don't have an issue with anyone who has conference pride. Uh, I don't have an issue with it personally. Oh, I don't either. I just don't get it. I mean, hey, look, if, whatever floats your boat. If you're happy, I'm happy. That's great. You know, <laughs> have a happy life. That's fine. I'm just saying, I don't. I personally don't understand it. There's there's a difference. I'm not uh, that just because doesn't make me happy doesn't mean it can't make someone else happy. And if you're happy, I'm happy for you. Try to explain this to him. So. I became a college football fan when I was roughly about nine and I went from zero to a hundred didn't know anything to can't get enough of it. And no, I had no influence on me or whatever those influences are. I couldn't even tell you what they were because nobody, if anything, I rekindled uh, sports enthusiasm within my dad. He didn't, influenced me. I influenced him. He had been a sports fan, played sports in high school and all that. Didn't impress that on, on me at all. But me getting involved in it then drew him to watch the games with me and everything. So no influence from every anyone, nobody, nobody else in the family, nothing. Uh, now I picked up some friends, that, you know, at school when I got into it. But basically from the time I'm like nine or 10 years old, my first season's getting into it I immediately knew, not because anyone told me, and just imagine this is in the prehistoric times of no social media or anything where you have just this inundation of information and people's opinions. But those first seasons I'm watching college football, I know Ohio State's in the Big Ten. And, I, and this is not a conscious decision like I am making a principled decision. This is a nine-year-old. This is a 10-year-old <laughs> Just naturally rooting for, I'm rooting for Illinois in their bowl game. I'm rooting for Indy. Like, it just drew me. It, just my heart just caused me to root for all the teams in the Big Ten in bowl games. Well, and you were a, a Midwest kid, so that's that's natural, <laughs> you know? I, I mean, I, I think it's I think it's great. You know, I, 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 I'm okay with that. But you did settle on a team, Mark. It's not like... Oh yeah, I would I I would never say, oh, Illinois won the national championship. That means Ohio State's great. Or <laughs> how many times was 22 year old Mark sitting there in I don't know what exact year, but in your 20s and Michigan's in the Rose Bowl, and you're going, come on, Wolverines, let's go, let's go well, for the conference. Michigan was the exception, <laughs> right? 
Yeah, they were the exception. So yeah, I mean that, that's what I'm saying. I I just can't. There's certain programs I just it, it's, it's weird. They changed a little bit over time. Like they used to be UCLA, which is uh, I just well because you you grew up in a town, you know, and you work with people and and your best friends. You know, my best friend in like third grade was his parents were UCLA alums, and so I mean it was just like it, it's it was definitely personal, you know. But I I just can't see rooting for the like the ducks or i just can't really see there's a time in my, like when i was younger asu i couldn't stand asu fans so i so that's why i just couldn't i couldn't see myself rooting a lot for the same reason the, there's nothing wrong with the university of oregon it's just oregon duck fans i don't know not all mikey you're out there you're awesome but most fans you know they, they drive you nuts how could you consciously you know and with any conscience root and hope that that team wins when you can't stand their their fan base. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So, anyway, we spent too much time on it. That's that's my two cents. All right. I'm looking then. forward to it though, Mark. I'm hoping that USC sometime cracks the top ten on one of these one of these things you do this year. Cracks the top ten? Come on. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. I think Lincoln's only one spot away. He'll get there one year. Well, he can might be this year. Not go seven and five. Maybe he will. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, listen, I think here's one thing. If we're going to give him crap for going seven to five last year, eight and five, actually, he going eight and five last year. Um, then we got to give him credit for the circus he walked into and, and went 11 and, and won 11 and uh, three, you know, the, the year before, because you can't like, it was still the same mess. I mean, people, re everyone, every program has had their Clay Helton that just ground their program into the dust left very few left the especially on the office of defensive line left the covers vacant you know completely vacant he Lincoln Riley put together that team in 2022 he literally did i mean th there's only three players from from Oklahoma but he brought in the pieces that they needed to have to be successful into the onto that team starting with Caleb uh bringing in that Bobby Haskins at left tackle bringing in the running backs Travis Dye that th he did he did a lot to make that team go almost kickstart it if we're going to hit him for being eight and five, I would think you, you definitely has to get some kudos for being um, 11 and three and then being a coach in his whole career that never lost more than two games in a season. I don't know how I'm sorry. I don't know how you guys have him out of the top 10. I cannot think of 10 coaches in college football that have a, a better body of work than Lincoln Riley. So yeah. We say, Oh, well the defense, it's not who has the best defense. It's not who has the best offense. It's who scores, who scores more points than the other team. That's that's what winning is about. And his winning record is pretty damn solid. If anybody wants to hear my rebuttal, sift through and find the last live stream that Tim joined that we argued. <laughs> Coaches ran. What was he? 11? He's 11. 11. And wait, who wrote down 10, 10, 9, and 8 for me? Do you remember offhand? I can look it up. I know, I know you took exception with Jonathan Smith, and I get it. Hmm. But man, look at what he took over. Yeah, but he had five years. I mean, if you look at him in year two, what 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 did he do in year two? I guarantee that any coach that is worth their weight is able to turn around USC more quickly than you can turn around Oregon State. There have been other guys to do it. Dennis Erickson did it. Um, uh, the guy that was a Chargers coach was an offensive like coordinator. Right. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, you know, it's not like it's unheard of to have success up in Corvallis. But it is, I, I agree. Your point is well taken. But also, I've been a USC fan my entire life, and I had never seen, never seen a defense as bad as the one that he inherited. This never, had never seen. I mean, Mark, in all the years you've watched football, have you ever seen, and that's another thing that, that's cyclical. People keep talking about how the SEC is so physical, so tough, the Pac-12, this blah, blah, blah. If we were talking about the most tough and physical and big defenses in, in the country back in the late 80s and early 90s, you would have to be talking about uh, about the Pac-12 as well. They're definitely in the conversation. There's there's no way you could have that. You couldn't have that conversation with those Don James defenses and those uh, Larry Smith defenses, uh, even, down in, even down in Arizona State with, um, what was his name? Oh, and then also, uh, 
use UCLA defenses with Terry Donahue in the late eighties and early nineties. All this stuff is so cyclical. It, 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 it doesn't make much sense to, to look and say, well, the last five years has been the last 15 years have been the sec. Uh, they've been the most dominant, but they really only became super dominant, you know, for a little, for like the last seven or eight years, I think like going all the way back. I, I'm just, it was like as cut and dry as it's been the last seven or eight years. Uh, the first half of that, there was, there, there were other contenders. It wasn't just a runaway for the SEC, in my opinion. But they started we'll winning national championships in 06. So 06 through 23 is 18 seasons. Yes, but you only need one team to be good in your conference in order to win a national championship. I, I get you. No, no. The, in any given year, Mark, I get you. There, there's, there's Florida. Yes. There's, there's Georgia. There's Alabama. There's LSU. Tennessee. Uh, I mean, not Tennessee. Uh, there's a. Uh, uh, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, LSU, Auburn. They've had five national championship teams. And outside of that Auburn one year. Uh, yeah. Any team, again, can step up. It really, it's been Alabama and, and Georgia and LSU in a couple of years. Nobody else has had anything close to five national championship teams. No, I know, but it doesn't mean every year LSU is. Well, of course not every really year. Good. It doesn't mean every year that uh, you're going to have. Every you know that those teams we just named, except that, for Alabama and Georgia, they're they're in their own they're in their own little, little that, category. That, that also doesn't mean that there aren't programs and teams outside of those five who weren't tremendous teams. They just didn't win a national championship. Twenty twenty two Tennessee, uh, Ole Miss in fourteen and fifteen, and last year uh, Texas A and M Johnny Manziel twenty twelve. So. But there's a number of really yes, good teams in other player. conferences that were really good teams that didn't win national championships. I, I get your point, but but at the same at the same time, you've got the you got Clemson. You know, their little their their mini run. You know, you had Ohio State with uh, Urban Meyer. I mean, that, so the, that's one team in those conferences, right? I think I conceded the last 15 years, but over the past seven or eight, they've been super dominant. That's all. Oh, that's that was only my point. That was I, I'm not ever once said that that anyone that says that the SEC hasn't been the best conference over that time span is, I don't know, like head in the So sand. if I'm interpreting what you have to say, you just made your statement, you believe it's probably overblown, overhyped, over-exaggerated. The depth of the SEC, I think, is a bit over-exaggerated, yes. Okay. However... They have had, well, because of the teams we just named. LSU, in, in, in every once in a while, is super, super good. And then Georgia and Alabama have been consistently among the elites in the sport for the past 10 years. So, I mean, just because other teams pop up once in a while. I mean, how many teams in the Big Ten have been in the, in the top 10? You know, only one team can win the national championship. Only one. And so if it's a round robin and, and there's programs, they've had the best programs is about it. Why am I talking about the SEC? I could absolutely care less. I don't even know why we're talking about it. Because we talk college football all the time. That's what we do. Yeah. Well, Tim, you've had a long day. So I appreciate you answering the call to come by for 10 or 15 or 45 minutes. Remember, bulls, bull records count, Mark. They're very important. Do. They're in my equation, especially uh, the the what we used to call the BCS bowl games. That's Those one records of my categories. That is one if, of my categories. If if you win like twenty five Rose Bowls, that should mean something. That is one of my categories. Yeah. Okay. All right, Mark. Awesome. Nice talking all the time. I'll see you later. Thanks, Tim. It's our guy Tim Prangley, the USC Channel. I'm telling you, folks, the USC channel. Between Tim, Matt, I'm just along for the ride. I guess I did start the channel. I did did a few things over there. But Tim, Matt, those guys are remarkable. They do a Friday night call-in show. It's, and as Tim likes to say on a regular basis, you drive the call-in show. It's your show, your topics, 
whatever you want to talk about. Monday nights, myself, Tim, Matt, we all get together on Mondays, 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific. All right, folks, we do appreciate you being here at the Voice of College Football. And I've heard from Corey. Don't know if he's going to jump on for sure. I have left the link in the chat, but I have been on for two and a half hours. So... <laughs> What's Notre Dame's record against Ohio State? Well, I certainly have that locked and loaded. It's not difficult. Notre Dame last beat Ohio State when my favorite vocalist, artist was one year old. And they've lost, what is it, six straight? 95, 96, home and home. Fiesta Bowl, Fiesta Bowl. Home and home again. Yeah, six straight for the Buckeyes. Uh, the Notre Dame-Michigan series, I don't know that off the top of my head. I know I missed the game. I know that that game from the time I started watching college football up through, what, about 20? When did they stop playing? It was about 2016, 17. Then they picked up one other game in 2019. I think that's the last time they've met. 2019, Michigan throttled Notre Dame. Um, yeah, there's just one clear exception on the Notre Dame situation, but I don't want to offend our fine Notre Dame fans here because the Notre Dame fans that show up at the voice of college football are first rate D rock Irish will and others, uh, don't spew a lot of nonsense about Notre Dame, uh, because we, we know what the deal is. Ohio comparing Ohio state and Notre Dame. That's just nonsense. So they understand that. Now, it may not be nonsense this year or next year or in the future, but for right now, it's nonsense. It's been nonsense for close to 30 years. It's not uh, an argument. Yes, so Jackson is filling in the blank that I uttered. My favorite artist was one year old when the last time Notre Dame beat Ohio State. I believe they were down 13 nothing in that game, and they came back and won 18-13, did Notre Dame. Michigan leads the series 25-17 and one. So they played 43 times. I'm guessing the first time they played was sometime early 1900s. So there would be some, there would be some, value in looking to see when those games were played. It's like Ohio State lost four consecutive games to Clemson. Well, those four consecutive games were spaced out all over the place. Was Clemson a better program than Ohio State? Hell no, not even close. But they beat Ohio State four straight times before Ohio State beat them the last time they played. But Clemson, to their credit, they won the games on the field when those two teams played. But uh, yeah, my my involvement with Notre Dame, Michigan, of course, and and that was maybe most of those years the most anticipated game for me, my favorite non conference game, USC Notre Dame, Michigan Notre Dame. I was a little bit more more prone to Michigan Notre Dame, just slightly because of the connection in the conference, but. Um, that being a week, typically a week one or a week two game. And uh, wow, during the 80s and 90s. Wow. Great, great stuff. Great stuff. Great theater. Oh, boy. Let's see what we're going to read here. Michael is letting us know. Ohio State has played Notre Dame's eight games ever. Where were you when we hoisted 13 national championships? So obviously you were not trying to play us for some reason. Uh, where was I personally? Well, 
by the looks of your picture there, Michael, I don't think I don't see too many gray hairs. I was pretty much in the same place you were. I was yet to be discovered. I was in non-existence uh, during most of those national championship runs by Notre Dame. I got to see one. 1977, did I really see that? No, I really didn't know what was going on. I kind of, kind of, that's right when I started watching college football. Probably didn't understand why are they voting on these teams. This makes no sense. Why are a bunch of sports writers voting on teams? Didn't think it took me too long to then be submitting term papers in high school to say, this is stupid. Sports writers vote for teams. They should be playing games called playoff games. Has anyone ever heard of the NFL? There you go. Yes. Yeah, so as Will is letting us know right there. I certainly have heard this. I don't know if it's valid. I don't know if this is coming from a valid source, but I've heard it from several sources. So it probably is the case. Yes. That Woody Hayes, there was a lot of recruiting. The, the recruiting overlap between those schools in the Midwest back then was even far superior and more extensive and more consistent than it is now. Tim is letting us know that Ohio State, Notre Dame, or Ohio State, USC, USC's up eight to two uh, during his lifetime. I don't know how old Tim is, but uh, during my lifetime, during my lifetime, Ohio State beat that guy. Uh, they called him the Juice. Uh, in the 69 Rose Bowl. And then they played in 72, 73, 74. And USC won two of those games. Um, USC blew out Ohio State. Ohio State blew out USC. And then the middle game came down to a two-point conversion. USC converted a two-point conversion. Was that Lynn Swan in 73? Uh, 1817. So that makes it two, two at that point. And then they played in the 1980 Rose bowl. That was just a heartbreaker. 17, 16, Charles white scored with, you know, a minute and change left. Uh, so there's three, two USC pulled off a slight upset in the 85 Rose bowl. So that makes it four to two. Uh, yeah, four two six two eight two. It's eight three for me uh, because then USC won a home and home. And again, I can either make the explanation, or depending on where you stand, you could call it an excuse. Uh, the next two games, nineteen eighty nine and ninety, well, USC was pretty much the best program in the Pac twelve at that point. They had just gone to a string of Rose Bowls. Uh, they beat beat Michigan, lost to Michigan, or lost to Michigan, beat Michigan to be more accurate, 88-89. And Ohio State was just getting off the deck uh, of what is the worst period in Ohio State football since pre-Woody Hayes. And that's the late 80s and beginning of the 90s. So those Ohio State teams were not really too well prepared to play those USC teams and got trounced in the Coliseum 42-3 and lost 35-26 in Columbus, which, unfortunately, they didn't finish the game. They didn't play the last 10 minutes of the game. There was lightning, and they just took the teams off the field. as a nine-point game with nine, uh, six or eight minutes left. Uh, USC won, and then they USC won home and home in... And these now these were legitimate wins right here in 08 and 09. And ironically, that second Ohio State team won the Rose Bowl against the Oregon team that beat USC. But USC went to Columbus and Matt Barkley engineered a late drive to win. Uh 18-15. I believe was the final score. 
believe it was what 15 15 12 does that make sense 15 12 and then matt barkley 18 15 i think was the final score and then ohio state won the cotton bowl in 2017 eight to three in my lifetime Notre Dame leads the USC the USC series 49-37 five ties. Thank you, D Rack Irish. We can go round and round about this. So Ohio State leads Notre Dame. Notre Dame leads USC. USC leads Ohio State. Michigan leads Notre Dame. Michigan leads Ohio State. Although I will take exception to that Ohio State uh, that Ohio State series. Uh, so that, that's one thing as Tim and I were talking about all time rankings, I, I don't have a perfect formula for it. And I under I explained all the various, I explained all the various steps to credibility, meaning, uh, playing four and five football games in 1902. Okay. We'll count them. They count. Is there a national championship there? Sure. Uh, when was Notre Dame and Michigan's national championships? Like Michigan's first national championship. When was Michigan's first national championship? In 1901. Okay. What were these guys doing? 1901. This is Michigan's first national championship. They defeated. Albion. Case. Indiana. Nice to see that Indiana has never lost its place in college football. Hierarchy. They lost 33-0. Northwestern. Buffalo. Carlisle. Was that with the great Jim Thorpe? Uh, at Ohio State, played Ohio State in the middle of the season. Chicago, Beloit, beat them 89 to nothing. And Iowa, and then they beat Stanford. Now, the only thing that looks somewhat familiar there is that they beat Iowa 50 to nothing, just kind of like they beat them in the last two of three Big Ten championship games. So we are not going to be taking any championships away from teams that earned championships under the context in which they were playing at the time. But again, Michigan won a game that year, 128 to nothing. So... The Big Ten Conference, the first year that Michigan won the national championship, the Western Conference is what it was at the time. You had Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, Northwestern, Indiana, Purdue, Chicago, Iowa. There was no Ohio State. There was no Michigan State. Uh, of course, uh, you Buckeye fans will know that, yes, Michigan le leads the series 61-51. So Michigan leads the series by 10. They won the first, was it 14 in a row? So this is me personally. Everyone can have their own. There is no right or wrong to this. There is no right or wrong. I would rather be leading the more recent series myself. I'm not that caring of what happened in 1901. It counts. It goes on the record. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying obliterate the records. I'm not saying get rid of it. Don't count it. I'm just saying I personally don't really care.
I apologize. I should be showing all of you this. And while we wait for Corey to join the show to talk about Yes, this was the famed Michigan team that won the first Rose Bowl. There it is. The point a minute team is what they were called. They, they beat Stanford in the Rose Bowl 49 zip. They had the most eye opening result came against Buffalo. 128 to nothing. And yes, they, they scored 550 points to nothing. Now, does that national championship count as much as last year's national championship? Uh, well, if, if, if you're a Michigan fan and you say no, then you also have to say it's not worth as much as the 2022 Georgia national championship. Uh, Fisherman. Who says 1901? Who cares? I tend to agree with you. Then you may ask, when do you care? Well, it's it's a progression. Again, there's not a hard and fast rule of when college football became relevant or valid or the results became valid. Michael says that Notre Dame has 22 national championships. Coming from you, Michael, I'm surprised that you don't say that Notre Dame has like 87 national championships. Where did you come up with 22? I will say that Notre Dame should claim a national championship in 1993. If I'm running the Notre Dame athletic department, then I would uh, claim 1993. I would claim... 1993. We're still checking on Corey. Hopefully, he's going to jump on with us. Google it. All right. Of course, Google knows everything. Notre Dame National Championships. Huh. Oh, they have a total of 22. Yes, Notre Dame has won 11 consensus national titles since their debut season in 1887. Eight from major wire services. Okay. Eight. They have 22 total from 11 unclaimed co-national champions. Well, they didn't claim them. Nobody else claimed them claimed them for them. So it sounds like they've got 11. I want to see this list of 22 national championships. I'm sure I could. Okay, here are their unclaimed national titles. Let's go with the most recent. Okay. Here, here's a valid claim right here. You guys ready for this one? Here's a valid claim. The 22nd and most recent claimed or unclaimed national championship that whatever sources that are completely out of their minds who know nothing about comparing what that score versus that score means. Look at this. Are you guys ready for this? Is everybody ready for this? This is this is Notre Dame's last unclaimed national title. Do you know when this was? Twenty twelve. Boy, that was a hell of a team, wasn't it? Seriously, who in the world is ever going to? Who is? If you find the moron out there who is claiming a national championship for Notre Dame in 2012, 
please bring them on the show. Please drag them on the show. Exactly, Adam. What is an unclaimed national championship? I can't even completely answer that question uh, because I don't care. Uh, I've not looked into it, but I'm guessing that there is a service out there. There is someone out there. It could be me. You could start throwing me into the equation, my national titles, and that could be another one. And that particular school, if they do not claim that national championship, then it's not a national championship. They did not claim it, but somebody out there is giving them a national championship. Now, who in their right mind is giving Notre Dame a national championship for this particular season? I don't know. But again, we, we know what happened here. They played a national championship game and they got obliterated. So that's just dumb. That's beyond dumb. Okay, let's see the one before that. 1993. Okay. Yeah. All right. Don't need to look this up. This is pretty simple deduction here. I have no issue with this. Notre Dame. I have no issue with this. I'm not saying that they should be some undisputed national champion. They did lose a game. But they, of course, defeated the team that was awarded the national championship, Florida State. So Florida State finished, I believe, 12-1 and and Notre Dame 11-1. and Well... Anybody with any common sense can see Florida State, Notre Dame, they've got the same record, and Notre Dame won the game. Shoot, if I recall, this Texas A&M team, were they undefeated? No, no, okay. I think that was the year before. So do we have any other teams vying for this? Uh, West Virginia was undefeated, but then they got destroyed in the Sugar Bowl. So it's basically a Florida State-Notre Dame argument, and Notre Dame won the game. So Notre Dame should be the national champion of 1993. So kudos to Notre Dame there. Yeah, that 2012 game, it was worse than the final score. Uh, I am not typically the guy that I am not the guy that reads body language. That's not me. I'm not one of these people that thinks that I can read people's minds by looking at their facial expressions and so forth. But Brian Kelly at halftime, when they grabbed him as he was headed to the locker room, truly looked stunned like we just ran into the ultimate buzzsaw and we we would love to just quit playing we we do not want to play anymore we are completely outclassed we do not have the athletes we cannot go up against these guys we have no prayer i don't know that i've seen that out of a coach to that extent he was completely befuddled. I don't know that he didn't see that on tape. Yes, Tim, I have I have outlined 1978 many times. All right, so apparently this next year that's in question for Notre Dame to claim a national championship is in 1989. And... That we will have to put on hold, even though I can debunk this very easily. They lost 27 to 10 to Miami. Forget it. You're not the national champion. Okay, that's that. All right. On the road. Straight from Iowa City. Don't you just love don't you love don't you love those moments when I just pop onto the stream? (laughs) Just so you're aware, I've told you this many times. I am not doing that. When I when I enter from my phone. It enters me into the stream automatically, and I have no way to control it. Well, I I believe that your phone just knows that you have privilege here at the voice. Yeah, I I guess so. Your your job, at least for the next 
well, however long you want to have me on here, your job is to keep me awake. <laughs> okay, because I still have, I still got about uh, two hours of driving now. I do not expect you to stay on for two hours. Two hours. Okay, oh, so but... you did the po- you obviously did the post game show from the stadium or somewhere close. Yes, yes, I did the post game show from Coach Patterson's crib. So very nice. Uh, I, I met. I get grabbed some. Uh, I grabbed a, a sourdough melt and uh, oh, got man, done. Make me hungry. Yes, sour, sour, sourdough melt from Culver's, which you probably know nothing about Culver's. I've heard of it. Very good, very good food. But anyways, uh, I'm still hungry, but uh, <laughs> if I eat any more, it'll probably make me more tired. But um, anyways, well, I, I'm 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 all for talking more football. I just got done with an entire day of it. So <laughs> well, well, be safe, be careful. Certainly, keep your eyes on the road and do all those good things that you need to do. Is is it a difficult drive? No. Okay. So straight shot. <laughs> yes, pretty much. It's uh, uh, well, it's it's basically two, two major four lanes, and you're you're home. Now, I've never been to Iowa. I hope to get there someday, but I'm guessing from my trips to the College World Series that there's not a whole lot of hills that you're encountering or swerves or much of that. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, there's your first mistake for comparing Iowa to uh, Nebraska, because even though Omaha is on the other side of the border, Iowa is actually very hilly, Mark. Oh, okay. Uh, that's a common misnomer. Nebraska is very flat. Iowa is very hilly. Wisconsin's very hilly. Um, so, no, it's uh, it's uh, this stretch of, of eastern Iowa heading into my old neck of the woods in the Marshall County area is actually very hilly. Okay. And uh, I stand corrected. So that's why I asked the question. All right. Well, speaking of hilly, uh, Deacon Hill. Oh, yeah. Um, that's a, that's a what, what, what a beautiful pun. Beautiful segue there. Yeah. Uh, yes. So uh, we will start with the much ballyhooed quarterback play there at Iowa. Uh, so start to evaluate for us what you saw on the field today. Well, I, I guess first first things first, uh, the uh, Iowa coordinators met with the media on Thursday. I was not a part of that, but uh, did obviously watch all of that um, on YouTube. And um, one thing that Tim Lester pointed out that I thought was noteworthy and I've repeated several times on the air since then, because I, I think it's kind of got to read between the lines about it, but he, he made the comment about fundamentals and he, he used the example of Deacon Hill's drop back. And I don't exactly remember the, the, the context of why the statement was even made in the first place, but um, there was a question about, you know, something specific that Deacon was working on or that, that uh, they were trying to work on. And Lester kind of deferred back to fundamentals and said, you know, we'd love to work on this or that. But like when I first got here, just, you know, he hasn't been here longer than a couple of months and, you know, only a few weeks of practice. We had to just figure out how what what the right drop back technique was for Deacon, you know, and, and Tim Lester is a former quarterback. And, you know, he made the, the point that there's a number of ways to skin a cat as it relates to dropping back and, and certain guys are comfortable in different ways. And they had to figure out what Deacon Hill's best drop back looked like. And that sounds sort of kind of juvenile or dumb, but I think that just is a microcosm of some of the issues they've had with just basic fundamental quarterback play. And that's why this is not an overnight fix for Deacon Hill, for Marco Linez, for any of the quarterbacks, any of the passing game. And you could, you know, funnel that down through, I think, the rest of the offense. So, um, I thought Deacon Hill had moments today where he was okay. You know, it's kind of like last year when he played. He had moments last year where he made a you know, nice throw here or there. He's got a big arm. Uh, had a nice throw down the sideline to Caden Weijin, who I think is probably going to be a, a on the two deeps. If, you know, if, the, if fall camp started tomorrow, he'd probably be on the, the pre-fall camp two deeps at receiver. Um, and, uh, you know, one nice throw down the sideline to him. Most of what we saw today was, I would say, within 20 yards distance. There wasn't a whole lot over the top. 
for either guy, either quarterback. Um, but Deacon Hill had a couple of just absolutely horrendous decisions. One where he, well, he threw two interceptions to linebackers, one of which was to Carson Shire, who's finally healthy. It was good to see Carson make a play, but I mean, there's just no, no offensive player anywhere in the vicinity. He threw it in like double or triple coverage for an interception. And then there was another one off of, a, I think, a deflection where Jackson Rexroth made a nice pick. But um, he's just erratic, you know, and I, I would guess that Tim Lester, I mean, again, me having the faith I have in Tim Lester at this point, having not seen the pro- finished product in the field, I've got faith in who he is as a coach, what I know about him as a person. Um, and as a former quarterback, that I think that he's going to get everything he can out of Deacon Hill, but there's no way that he's done that in just a few weeks' time. Um, so Deacon's a warm body right now. Cade's not anywhere close. Cade was out there running around with a knee brace on and, you know, was not in playing 11-on-11, 11 11, but he was out there at times and looked very ginger on that knee. Um, very, uh, very unsure of himself, especially when trying to, to move side to side. So he's still got at least a month or two of recovery before he's cleared. Um, Marco Linez, I thought flashed, but you know, we've heard that he struggled with his arm at times this spring and even into the bowl prep last, last December, I guess I should say last, um, last fall, really all the fall he got here, um, during the summer. And, uh, but he had some nice plays. He's really good on his feet. He runs like a running back. It's probably as athletic as we've seen a guy in that position since probably Brad Banks. That's not exaggerating. Um, but they've just got a couple of guys who are kind of polar opposites of one another. One with a big arm that is a, well, for lack of a better word, Mark, an overweight statue. And then you have another guy who's not got a real big arm, not real accurate, but boy, he's electric on the ground. Mm. Um, so, you know, how do you find the, the, the even balance? I think the one thing that we can be pretty confident in, Mark, is even if those guys don't take big jumps, if they can get a guy like Kate healthy, or you can go to the portal and get another quarterback that you have confidence in, maybe, just maybe, Tim Lester will make Kirk Ferentz comfortable with playing multiple quarterbacks, and they'll be able to utilize the skill sets of – you know, a Cade McNamara and a Marco Linez. Marco Linez is too good of an athlete to not be on the field. He just is. I mean, then they won't have him. But, I mean, until that happens, I don't think that's going to. I have no reason to. Uh, I know the Linez family. I don't not been given any indication that he's not happy. But, again, it's the portal, so you never know what's going to happen with these kids. But until he leaves – I'd be doing everything I can to get him on the field, even if his arm's not where it needs to be. So you mentioned Tim Lester and even superseding the quarterback competition for some people would be the first look at the Iowa offense under Tim Lester, which of course it's going to be vanilla uh, because they don't want to put too much out there. Number one, Uh, number two, just uh, as you mentioned, going back to rudimentary quarterbacking fundamentals is where they are right now. And hopefully they made quite a bit of progress in 15 sessions in the spring. But uh, did you get any indication that this offense is going to look different? I expect it. I think we both expect it to, to look different. Tim Lester's accomplished in the position, but did you get any glimpses of that today? I thought the, the running game was a little bit more fluid. There were less breakdowns up front, whether you attribute that specifically to Lester's new system. Um, I do think there, there's a lot of pre-snap motion, uh, a lot more pre-snap motion than we ever saw with Brian Ferentz or Ken O'Keefe. So that's going to keep the, the defense on their, on their heels. Uh, we had an opportunity. Um, I, I watched the game from the press box simply because it was freezing cold out. Uh, it's amazing. We had 80 degrees for a couple of days last weekend, and it was like in the 30s and gusting winds today. It was just miserable for a football for, for something like this. Um, so I watched the game from the press box, and then after the media was able to get some field access, and we were able to talk to talk to several players. Uh, Tyler Fisher was one I talked to. Jamari Harris, both those guys were out with injuries, but they were, you know, they're precautionary, so the, the media made them available or the, the – uh, university made him available to the media 
And I know one thing that was said uh, regarding the offense by I think it was I think it was either Jamari or it might have been um, might have been a different player. I'm trying to think of the third guy we talked to. But anyway, somebody made the comment that first few practices with this new system. And keep in mind, the offensive players were new to the system as well, but the, the defense did uh, catch the uh, the offense did catch the defense off guard quite a bit, according to these defensive players, because they were just things that they weren't used to seeing, and just a lot more going on. I think from a linebacker's perspective, there's um, there's going to be some some challenges, test of communication. Um, you know, we haven't talked about this yet, Mark, but the new the new uh, helmet. Uh, communication thing that that's gonna it's gonna be an interesting storyline you know too with the new offense uh so they were able to test that out a little bit but i think again a lot of it's going to be the the motion you're not going to see a ton of i mean if deacon hill's playing even if Kate mcnamara is playing i don't think you're going to see a ton of quarterback design runs um but i think the, the point is you're going to get you're going to keep that that defense on its heels hopefully not able to tee off as much as we've seen even in maybe what we typically consider to be obvious passing situations. One thing Lester did say Thursday is, you know, just like with, with every offense, stay ahead of the chains and it makes things a lot easier, but his goal is to take shots down the field. So even though we didn't see a ton of shots down the field, you're going to see more attacking. And I think with, with Tim Lester and his background as a play caller and as a, a quarterback, that's that's another reason why I, have, I just have a lot of confidence in the notion that they're going to utilize who they have personnel-wise and that he'll get the most out of them, whether that means play two quarterbacks, three quarterbacks. Um, you know, I think it was mentioned the other day, was it Lester or, or it might have been um, Kirk Ferentz. Someone brought up how I think it was LaShawn Williams is looked pretty good. Maybe it was Terrell Washington. I think Terrell Washington who switched over to – receiver recently that he's looked pretty good throwing the football um, in a couple of instances. Now that doesn't mean they're going to run him as a wildcat, but I, I just think that, that having a guy who's offensively geared, so to speak, which is obviously what you want with the coordinator and play caller. Um, they're going to have, they're going to have more success. There's a reason why they were 130th in the country in total offense, because they didn't recruit well. They didn't develop well. They didn't uh, play call well. They didn't evaluate talent well. They didn't game plan well. You don't become that bad, Mark, unless you're bad on a lot of fronts. So they will improve. <laughs> now it's just a question of how much, and you know some of that's going to come down to to you know health of guys like McNamara, what they could do in the portal here in the next couple of weeks, and of course how some of these younger guys develop. So, Corey, this is not a situation where score is kept or teams are divided or anything like that. But it did it just appear, you know, based on what we know of this, the the, the makeup of the team, the offense versus the defense, there's no comparison. Again, it's a complete aberration in college football. Then you put that together with everything that you've just outlined of them breaking in a new offense and the quarterback play not being extraordinary today. Did the defense just... Did they give up anything? Um, I, I, well, let me say this first. Every, I I've been watching Iowa football spring open spring practices and kids day practices for the majority of my life, and I don't. There's never been that I can remember ever been an open practice where the offense looked even competent. Now, part of that is because the offense, more often than not, has not been competent. <laughs> but like. <laughs> I'm just saying in these, these practices, sure. it's, it's just what it is every, every year. Um, so, so with that being said, trying to kind of, again, read between the lines and, and understand history. Um, yeah. I mean, Iowa, Iowa scored a couple of touchdowns in 11 on 11, uh, Marco Linez again, they, right. As of right now, the way that Iowa operates things, and I'm guessing this is the way a lot of schools do things they're not allowing their quarterbacks to get hit. So, you know, there's some plays that could have easily been sacks in real time that, you know, were not sacks because guys held up, but I, there were, there were, I think two touchdowns, uh, one for each guy. I think I know Marco Linez had a rushing touchdown. 
uh, because I know I know that because I remember it was it was followed by a, a blocked PAT off a free edge rusher. Um, so yeah, I mean there was some success there. Um, I think you're going to see Terrell. I mentioned Washington. I think you're going to see him play a lot of receiver um, because they're pretty thin right there, Mark. You know, Jacob Bostic entered the portal a few days ago. Uh, he's already got offers from. I saw he pulled in another offer from Pitt. He's got an offer from Iowa State, Vandy. Um, he's got some power five offers, which is surprising for a guy who's never really set foot in the field. Um, but that just limits Iowa's depth again. I know Don Patterson, you'll like this, Mark. Don Patterson made the comment to me privately and said it on the air. He was impressed with, with Caleb Brown today. Um, you know, Caleb came in last year, a lot of expectations. Really didn't work into the fold until, you know, halfway through the season. And even then, uh, you know, he, had, he struggled with some drops. He knew he was electric after the catch, but, um, you know, wasn't always consistent, I don't think, off the line. He looked pretty good today. I mean, I'm not no expert in route running. And obviously, um, you know, you're, you're looking at a small sample size, but he didn't have any drops. Um, Marco Linez's best play was a 20-yard uh, throw to the sideline to, to Caleb Brown. You know, if they could just get one guy out wide to step up and be like a, a go-to guy, boy, th- this offense goes from being – crap to being at least i think adequate because you know you're going to get really good production out of tight ends and they've got a strong running back room but it i you know it's amazing how bad this offense has been for so long and yet i don't know that i i don't know of a year necessarily where there have been two positions that are so obvious so obviously the the weaknesses of the team like wide receiver and quarterback without a doubt they're strong at tight end. They're strong at running back. You know, I don't know how strong they are on the offensive line, but they're really experienced. You know, they should be able to piecemeal an uh, uh, offensive line together. But, boy, they got to figure out quarterback and receiver. And I'd say those are two pretty important positions. It's a little bit easier to evaluate players during a spring game if you know – what the approach is, meaning sometimes they'll put the first team quarterback behind a second team offensive line or the first team defense is playing the first, the second team offense or whatever the dynamics are. So was there anything that you know of that in terms of personnel deployment that may skew your thinking about how a particular unit played? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I did notice that Caleb Brown, that, you know, they're, not only did Bostic lead this past week, but um, I know Alex Moda was out with an injury. Um, Seth Anderson missed all, basically all of spring with an injury. That's not good news because he was, you know, he's considered to be one of their, their two or three best receivers, and he missed all of last spring after transferring here. So this is basically a second straight spring where he's not played. So um, I thought it was – kind of interesting that we saw Caleb Brown run a little bit more with with the twos than I would have expected um so maybe that's an you know I'm not a guy that I know there are some people in the media that love to track you know who's running with the ones how many snaps the ones how many snaps the twos I'm not that guy but I did notice that Brown was out there a lot with Linez and Linez is basically getting all the snaps with the twos and the threes and that's kind of been the talk this week you know, with social media, people frustrated by the fact that that uh, Tim Lester made the comment Thursday that Deacon Hill was getting basically all the snaps, almost all the snaps with the ones. Well, normally I would be critical of that, Mark, but because of their unique quarterback situation, only having two scholarship guys, Tim's reasoning on it was, and I think it makes sense to an extent, Marco was not at a place where he was up to speed with signals and certainly the new offense not that Deacon was an expert on it but you know Deacon had game experience they wanted to give Marco as many snaps as they could so they're giving him all of the snaps versus the twos and the threes so they give Deacon the ones and they give Marco more snaps against lesser competition I think for now that makes sense 
Um, and so maybe that's part of the reason why they make guys like Caleb Brown in there a little bit to give Marco something to work with. And if that's the case, that's fabulous. Um, I don't think we, we nobody really got too specific with Kirk or, or Tim on that, but we didn't get to talk to Tim today, but um, we did get to talk to, to, to Kirk briefly after. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I guess you probably should know if you, a couple other of these, you're talking about personnel groups. I mentioned a couple of the defensive players that were out, Jamari, Kyler Fisher, um, but there, Iowa's still down Logan Jones. Their their center, Logan Jones, has been out, I think, most of spring. Jennings Dunker, starting right tackle, is still out. I think it's uh, his is, um, soft tissue, it sounds like. Seth Anderson, as I mentioned, he is out. Um, and uh, let's see here. They've got a tight end out. Addison string is out as well with an injury, uh, soft tissue. So, you know, that affects things a little bit, but younger guys got maybe some extended ride that wouldn't normally, and uh, they're they're pretty strong at those other positions, not named quarterback and receiver. Corey Branda from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Uh, check out Corey's full breakdown with Don Patterson, Coach Don Patterson and Corey got together after the spring game. That's, of course, at Corey's channel from the Hawkeye of the Storm. So that's a must-see. Uh, over there so you'll get even more analysis from Corey and coach Don and then of course uh, join Corey and myself Tuesdays 5 30 Eastern 4 30 Central Hawkeyes live it's on the Iowa channel it's a good time with Corey and myself breaking down Iowa football all right Corey well thanks for checking in and how close are you now <laughs> Oh, only about an hour and a half. Let, let me say this before I get off the air. Sure. Uh, where's the Where's the Cade Borat video? The who? The Cade Borat video. Well, you have no idea say, what I'm talking about. Well, as soon as you say Cade, I'm thinking Cade McNamara. Uh, this is a different Cade. Cade. So, but then Cade must be a popular name now because you got Cade McNamara, you got offensive lineman Cade Piper, uh, and they got a commitment today from a transfer, Mark. Um, he was actually at the game. Cade okay. Ford, who is a an FCS, he was uh, let's see, first he was a let me get this right because I don't have it in front of me. He was first team FCS freshman All American um, at North Dakota last year. Spell He's his a, last name. B O R U D. U D. Okay. I have not looked at any of his tape yet. All I know is an all he was a freshman All American last year in the FCS. And he was at Iowa today at Iowa Giron. And then we got a commitment out of him within a few hours. So I don't know what that means. Is is, is he gonna be on scholarship right away? Does he come in as a walk on to start? Um, I don't. I don't have the answer to that. Um, all I know is Logan Jones has been out with an injury. Uh, Michael Mislinski is one of their centers who's been out, and he, that guy's been dealing with injuries for the last two years. It feels like, so maybe they're just trying to, to garnish some depth there. Um, but boy, uh, you, you like the sound of. I mean, I know North Dakota is not known to be a power, but FCS All American, freshman All American. That's a that's a pretty cool honor. So. Um, Maybe he'll come in there and, and uh, end up playing some. Well, you know what this sounds like to me, Corey. It sounds like I've got an hour and a half to be the fill-in for the go-to source for everyone concerning Iowa football. I've got only an hour and a half window to fill that void uh, and post a video on on Mr. Borid. Yeah, you're gonna post. Are you gonna post a video on Borid? <laughs> Well, considering I just discovered who he is about 30 seconds ago, uh, and I've been on the air now for three hours and nine minutes, I don't know that my motivation is that high, especially considering you will produce a, a video that's 150 times better than mine. Uh, uh, here's what I think you should do. And I think you should just do this to test the waters, and I think you should post it the Iowa channel only. But do a breaking news video. Kate Board commits to Iowa. And you don't have to know that much, but I'm curious because I'm not going to be able to get home in time to do a breaking news video. You could do a breaking news video right now and we'll see what happens. 
And what am I going to say about him? He's 6'2", 305. He's a freshman All-America at the FCS level. He's from Des Moines. Uh, He has no ranking coming out of high school. He's got a transfer ranking of number 50 among interior offensive linemen and 653 overall, according to 247 (laughs) Sports. And that's that's the end of my – oh, no, no, no. We we do have a – breakdown from alan true the uh national recruiting analyst i can just read that yeah okay see um see i didn't even know he's from des moines that's how little i know about this kid and i haven't been able to even look into this i didn't know he's from des moines okay it makes sense it makes sense that he would be so eager to be at iowa so maybe he will walk on maybe they won't you know that's the other thing there i was for they're four above the limit still. They got to get rid of some guys. Um, you know, at one time I thought, ah, it's it's not right to start speculating about who may leave. And now everybody's leaving all the time, Mark. So who cares? <laughs> I, I'm happy with talking about it. So maybe we can do a video on that. Like top five guys that should enter the transfer portal. Because <laughs> I got that list. I've been brainstorming that list for a while now. Okay. Uh, Eric has been asking me so much here. She's not here tonight, but, uh, throwing me, which I'm very appreciative super chats, basically with the same question over the last few days, who should Iowa get as a quarterback, Mark? And I said, Erica, let me scan the nation. I will find five quarterbacks for Iowa. Well, I can tell you this right now. Uh, I know you're, uh, we both talked about the rumor about Lincoln Keenholz. And I told you when we talked about it initially that, uh, I have no idea where those rumors came from. I told you that I was told by somebody in the that's connected to the Keenholz family that he was going to be keeping his options open this spring. That was before the end of Ohio State spring practice. He has not entered the portal. Um, and I know you're, you had an Ohio State guy who was adamant that, that there's no connection with Iowa. And I, I talked to an Iowa, somebody uh, with the Iowa media today that said the same thing, that they've been told there's no connection there. So, um who knows? Maybe Keenholz will, will stay put. Uh, and Devin Brown hasn't entered. Are you surprised that one of those guys hasn't entered already, Mark? Uh, I will be surprised if no one enters. Uh, sometimes this takes, you know, some vetting out. Maybe they're having conversations, and they, they certainly have time to think it over a, a little bit. But yes, if we hit the end of the portal period, and there's still five quarterbacks at Ohio State. It, of that caliber, yes, I will be surprised. Have you ever noticed that when I get on here and talk football with you on your main channel, people in the chat, it's almost like they're not even really paying attention. Like they're just having their own conversations about other stuff, which is fine. Maybe that means it's just like a relaxing talk show in the background. But people really aren't engaged with what we're saying. They're just kind of yammering about their own nonsense. You ever notice well, that? One of, us, one of us made the mistake of bringing up food. And so therefore, for about... 20 minutes it was nothing but food talk oh okay so we propelled I didn't that. Realize you, you were you've been on the air for three hours yes oh my goodness yes i've broken down the likes of illinois and texas a&m and on and on we had our buddy levi stevenson came by because i was oh, yeah. there <laughs> uh, hey i heard today. i heard i heard hey I heard their their spring game as I'm on my way back to Cyclone Country. I heard their spring game was a real slobber knocker today, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> there was one touchdown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did, didn't sound didn't sound too impressive, but uh, but I, I believe Rocco Beck was out. Correct? Yes, he did not play. Uh, the article I read was that he was begging Matt Campbell to play him, but. They, they did not play him, nor their two top wide receivers. Now, uh, the the end of the conversation with Levi drifted into the whole realignment business and all that's going on and the Big Ten and the SEC possibly pushing everyone out. And, and uh, Levi made a comment like, you know, I can't worry about this. Sure, we should be included in big time college football. But if we get cast aside, then all we'll be doing is like rooting that Iowa gets the shit kicked out of them. <laughs> <That's just sad. laughs> uh, yeah, it, isn't that kind of where the conversation normally goes when you have Levi on? 
Like, there's so much vitriol. It's amazing to me. It is amazing to me how much vitriol there is. By the way, had this Iowa spring game not fallen on the same day as the Iowa State game, I would have been in, in, well, it's not, I always want to say Cyclone Stadium. It used to be Cyclone Stadium. I'd have been in Jack Trice today, Mark. I got nothing against the Cyclones, usually. And you, so. and, and you would have shown up and delivered, what, a video on your, or some kind of post game? or I could have, I could have been on site for you, Mark. I could have been your your voice of college football, uh, what would you call it? A, a anchor, or a, not an anchor, but a... Correspondent. Well, I was going to say correspondent, but uh, what's the word when you... When I, it's late, man. I'm tired. Stringer? I thought yeah, of stringer was exactly. I was trying to think yeah. of stringer. That's what I was trying to think of. No, I I, I would uh, term you more of a correspondent than a stringer. By the way, uh, how about this? Do you know who's coming to prefer? We, there used to be a lot of big concerts back, like Rolling Stones, back in the day at at Cyclone Stadium. You know who's coming to Jack Trice though here uh, next month to perform, Mark. Okay, don't be surprised if I've never heard of this individual. Oh, if you've never heard of this these individuals, then you've li- you <laughs> you really do live under a rock. <laughs> um, no, uh, George Strait. Okay, sure. And Chris Stapleton. Okay, yes, I know who they are. Yes, they're pretty big, pretty big acts for Ames. We don't typically Ames doesn't typically generate those types of acts, so they're going to be in concert together. Uh, and then a, a group called Little Big Town. They're pretty pretty popular too so um anyways you want to talk more about my sourdough melt earlier mark no i don't because i'm hungry <laughs> uh, oh, okay never mind i see some people in the con- i saw somebody in the chat make a comment about that so I-, I was uh at a friend's house today and i'm not if they if they are in any way watching which they aren't they've got better things to do and they're they're very early to bed people so they're, they're not up right now uh, but they, they, they feed, but they are very kind and well, way too kind feeding me all the time. But today there were some other things that they had to be doing. And I just went over there to watch the Michigan spring game. And, uh, so I had very little to eat. Uh, we didn't like eat like we had the week before during the spring game. And then, yeah, I've been doing all this ever since I did a Michigan post game for almost three hours. So I've done six and a half hours of post game today. Well, um, I just I do want to say, do you like sourdough melts? Yes, I do. There is nothing better than good sourdough bread. Yeah, grilled, buttered. Add a nice fresh patty, and then you put some grilled onions on it, like. There's nothing better than that. Yeah, that sounds extraordinary. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm going to I'm going to be relegated to bacon and eggs right now. That's the only thing that is really n- not that that's nourishing, but you know what I mean. That's filling that I have here. That's easy to fix. Yeah, that that just doesn't sound. I honestly, I'm not, I'm not trying to rub it in. I actually would like another one because I thought the one that I got, I paid, you know, everything is so expensive now. I paid seven, over $7 for a double, by the way, while I was in the drive through waiting for my sourdough melt, the car in front of me, like started smoking and oh, like, okay. sounded like guy trying to start. It sounded like it was in for the process. A second, of for a second, I thought the car uh, ahead of you, you were going to tell us that they looked behind and they they were fans and they jumped out and greeted you. No, 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 no. I usually wear a disguise so that I can keep all the people off of me. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're smart. You figured that out a long time ago. Yeah. If only you could follow that advice, Mark. Yes. Yes. I've just been approached so many times. Yep. Yeah. So it's three or four in the last year. It's It's picked up a little bit here recently i i don't feel sorry for you though because it was only recently that i found out you're no longer in the midwest so <laughs> this shows you how close you and i are i didn't even know where oh, you live. Come on. <laughs> i don't even know what state you're in you know everything that i've got going on in my life it's a very boring life i, I let you know just uh I, you knew that i was 
Uh, you knew that I was looking for a house. You knew that I was on the market. I just, yeah, it just got past me in terms of like specifically saying, Corey, I'm doing this on this day and leaving to go here. Well, We've I got a super that. chat here. Uh, and this is coming in from our buddy, Minnesota Dave, who says, oh, Minnesota Dave, Minnesota Dave says with all the fans that were throwing water bottles at the referees after the gopher game, you would think that it would be easier to find a quarterback at Iowa. Say that again. He's talking about with all the fans that were throwing water bottles at the referees after the Iowa, Minnesota game, you would think that it would be easier to find a quarterback at Iowa. What? Fans were throwing water bottles. What are we talking about? We're talking about after the bad call. Yeah. Then you would have to fill in the rest. You would know better than me if there was any uh, nasty scene at Iowa Stadium after that at Kinnick. I mean, I'm not. A, I wasn't. I wasn't in the stands for that game. I don't remember that. But what does that got to do with finding a quarterback? He's saying that the Iowa fans must have really good you know, throwing arms and one of them could try out for. Oh, uh, see, if you got to, if you, if it needs to be explained, Minnesota <laughs> Dave, it's not worth. In fact, Minnesota Dave, just stick to call. When you call in, just sing the Minnesota fight song. That's, that's, you do better just remembering the fight song. Minnesota Dave, you send in a super chat saying whatever you want at any time you want. <laughs> as long as it's a super chat, Mark. <laughs> Did you buy, can I, real quick, one more thing. Do you realize, I won't even say what show it was. Oh, boy. But I went back and looked at some Super Chats that were donated by our, by some of my loyal followers on YouTube. Okay. And I did the math. Our, our uh, favorite platform that we so dearly enjoy doing business on Paired with whatever other services take a cut of these donations, thirty-seven oh, percent. Okay. How did you do the math on that? You can go back. Oh, okay, because you see the gross total that comes in from the viewer, and then you can, yeah, you, yes, the platform tells us, yes, how much we receive. Yeah, that's about what it is. Yeah, thirty-seven percent. Yes. You knew that. That's, that's, no, I thought it was closer to 30. 37? You did all that math just to just to differentiate 30 and 37%? Well, that's significant. Well, it's significant, but I think, can you imagine, if I took all the time to go through all the Super Chats for an entire year or whatever the, the, the span I didn't, of time? Well, no, I'm, I'm saying, I'm talking about one show that I went back okay, and... Okay, okay. All right, I got. You. I looked at one specific show because it was a it was the last. Show, well, I'll just say it, it was the last show of the women's basketball season, and yeah. so we had a lot of people, a lot of support. People were wanting to help the show out, and I appreciate that. But then you realize that wow, okay, all these super chats and YouTube takes almost forty percent of it. It's crazy. Uh, well, since we've gone there, we might as well go the full distance and just let people know. Okay, you give super chats, as Corey just stated. We cannot express how much we appreciate that. You are giving of your resources, your hard-earned money. So we, we appreciate that so much. Also understand that you can give to both Corey and myself. You see there on the ticker down below, Venmo, PayPal, and Cash App. And we get 100% there. Now, I will, going forward, I commit to this right now that I will give recognition to all those people that, because I understand many people want to, want recognition um, and they want to be able to say something as well, make a statement. So I will give recognition to those people that, that uh, give on Venmo pay pal and cash app, but you have to understand our position is we don't want to not encourage you to donate here on this platform because let's face it, there is a tendency not to give because there's a little bit more effort to have to go onto another platform and then, give there so we're kind of in a catch-22 yes but it's very easy to donate when you have links to venmo paypal cash app um 
I mean, it's all right there in, in your description and my description. Very easy to do. There you go. And and here here's the other thing people need to realize, Mark. People can donate, and I don't know about Venmo and Cash App, but you can donate via PayPal even if you don't have a PayPal account. Hmm. Let me repeat that. I didn't you can that. donate by means of PayPal even without a PayPal account. You can donate, make a donation with a credit card as a recurring payment or a one-time payment and through their system. It's a secure system. You don't have to know how to get a PayPal account or deal with all that. So it's very easy to do. That I did not know, but uh, that is certainly worth noting. And uh, yeah, we, we, we both appreciate everything uh, in regards to those uh, donations, everyone. So thank you for that. But let's keep in mind. So for example, on Patreon, this seems to be much more reasonable. It of course is. Patreon takes like 8%, something like that. 12%. It's, it's, it's something in that range. It's, it's more what you would expect. I do understand the platform is in a business and would take a percentage, but 37% is unreasonable. Yeah, I agree. And and now I think part of that, I don't think it's all YouTube. I think when Apple users donate, I think Apple charges them, charges them a fee if it's through Apple Pay. I don't know how that works, but that's what I've read. So anyways, just so people are aware. But the same, you know what? The same is concerned with membership costs. You know, like Jim, I'm sure you really appreciate Jim being a member, um, but YouTube is providing a service, so and and we appreciate that. But it's it's just a reality. People people deserve to know where their money's going. Absolutely, absolutely. Jim, thank you. Yes, uh, Jim R. Thank you so much for becoming a YouTube channel member, and um, I will drop something in the members only section to kind of give you the greetings and let you know what you get with your membership. But thank you so much for that. Right, Corey, I'm sure it's been a long day because uh, Iowa hit the field at 1045. So you were obviously up and at them bright and early. Yep. Left teams. Uh, let's see. A little before eight o'clock. Dunkin Donuts did have a free cold brew medium cold brew with any purchase this morning. So I took advantage of that. You can make all that? the faces. You can make all the faces you want to make. Well, I'm just, I'm just curious. You, listen, I'm here's the deal. Face. You make, you waste your, you waste your sugar intake on sleeves of Oreo cookies. All right. I use it on morning coffee. So what is a cold brew? Cold. C-O-L-D. Cold, cold brew. Okay, I know they okay, do. Okay, listen, okay. I, I know you, you were like naming some specific drink, and that's why I made this face because I was going to ask you, what is a cold brew? Okay, a cold brew. Got it. Got it. Cold brew. It's a cold, right. cold iced coffee. Hey, both of my children would be right there with you. They are frequent visitors to whether it's Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts to get their whatever Frappuccino, whatever it turns oh. out to be. Well, yeah. I, I'm not in. The <laughs> yeah, and I, I yeah. Uh, I, I like a good coffee. I don't like a lot of sugar, but free is free, Mark. Free is free. Free is free. And uh, it reminds me what I missed today. Have you ever heard of Jets Pizza? What is it called? Jeff? Jets. Jets, like the New York Jets. Oh, I don't think we have that here. No. Okay. Yeah, so they, they have Jets Pizza in Ohio. They have Jets Pizza here. I didn't know that there was one, but I, I had a uh, appointment the other day. And as I was coming back home, I passed the Jets Pizza. So I did a, a quick right because I went into the Jets Pizza because I love Jets Pizza. Uh, it's just really good. It's fairly affordable. I was accustomed to getting four slices for like eleven fifty something like that. So I went in there. It was the same price as it was in Ohio. But I saw this banner, Saturday only, four slices for $4. Wow. That's got you written all over it. Yeah, but I forgot about it. I was sitting here with everyone for six and a half or seven hours. <laughs> so that, that has passed me by.
All right. Uh, we do have now 53 uh, YouTube channel members. So thank you so much for your your support, everyone. And, and uh, Jim R. Corey, can you make it home without us? I'll do my best, Mark. Okay. Well, it was great to talk to you as always. And thank you so much for, uh, I, I will clip this off. This will be on the Iowa channel. And uh, I don't know when I'm going to do that. Maybe tonight. But uh, thank you for filling us in on everything, uh, Hawkeyes. And uh, when is your next big video or live stream? Um, probably have some content either tomorrow or Monday and then uh, have a podcast here early next week. Um, and yeah, we'll have, you know what, Mark, that Indiana fever season's creeping up on us. So <laughs> you, we're gonna, you, we're, you huh? would love, and when I say love, I say that in quotes, meaning you would roll your eyes and have all sorts of other responses. If you would hear the conversations that I would, that I have had with my friends, not initiated by me, uh, about this whole women's basketball, Caitlin Clark now on into the WNBA. I believe you. I, I was even trading. Well, I shouldn't say trading. That would be that would be incorrect because I was the only one firing. There was no one firing back uh, tweets to our, our president even the other day. I think I saw that, Mark. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think I saw that. It's just okay. buffoonery. <laughs> uh, I can't you know, help myself. In all seriousness, I. We have committed to our viewers that we're going to have a post game show for I think maybe the first Indiana Fever game of the season. So, well, I think you should. So, I, I think I'm getting misheard on this. I, I think it's great. It, I I understand where you're coming from on on a number of things. Let's just stick with that. You know, I don't agree with you on everything as it relates to this sure. conversation, but. But I do understand where you're coming from. On and and uh, I, I do believe that Caitlin Clark and the impact that she has already had, it's its obvious she has already increased without it being counted or being able to be tangibly seen and counted yet. Just by the mere fact, as you have pointed out, I think the number is 36 of 40 games being selected to be broadcast on network television. Uh shows that the the increase in the league revenue is going to be positively impacted by her. She already has impacted it. We just don't know how much and how long it will last. Correct. Yep. And should that how much should that benefit everybody else right away? I mean, yeah. I don't I don't think there's any anybody that anybody with a straight head on that can say that it should make massive increases to salaries league wild man that's not that's not fair sometimes i bring these things up and we get into these things because you can probably tell i think many of my viewers can and some of them actually encourage me that that i am very tempted to go into other topics beyond sports <laughs> I, be I believe that as well <laughs> so uh, I think you should have a. I think you should have a food channel, is what I think. Oh Lord, no, that's not. That's not anywhere close to the top of the list. There, would, we would have a lot of channels before we would. What do would, I? Would you? Would you I, ever? Would you ever compete in an Oreo eating contest? No, 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 no. I want no part of that. I enjoy my food. I don't want to not enjoy it. I, I don't eat fast. And even though I do consume way more than I should, it doesn't come close to those <laughs> kind of people. What? How many Oreos can you have in one setting? Can you remind us of that real quick? Well, I had 37 when I did oh, that. Goodness. But I made two huge mistakes. No, I made three huge mistakes. Number one was... You made 38. No, you made 37. <laughs> 30, 37 mistakes. Yes, I did. So the, the first mistake was... Can you can you believe I, I am a bit embarrassed to admit this that 
an hour, two hours, three hours before this live stream, knowing that I was put, putting myself up to that, I still couldn't resist eh, eating a cookie, have another cookie. <laughs> so I had like 10 or 12 cookies like a couple hours before. Yeah, that's, that's, you got, you got a problem. Now I will say this, a friend of ours made some chocolate chip cookies yesterday okay. or no, two nights ago. And then my wife brought home like eight of them or no, brought home 10 of them. Uh, I think she had two and I ended up eating like the other seven or eight. Now these are not like little, these are, you know, they weren't big, big cookies, but they were homemade cookies. Yeah. And that kind of made me sick, but you know what the secret recipe was in these cookies? You may not like this. But instead of vanilla extract, she used almond extract. Hmm. That sounds good. And if, if you like like a Dutch letter or something like that, uh, it, it was really good. So that was mistake number one. I had cookies before I even started. Mistake number two, I purchased these cookies with the full, with the thought that uh, you know, I buy double stuff Oreos on a regular basis, but I should have been thinking, Mark, you were not purchasing these cookies for your enjoyment. You were purchasing them to get through this live stream. You need to get just regular Oreos. So that was mistake number two. I got double stuffs. Mistake number three, I needed milk to wash it down. And I drank like three glasses of milk over the course of the 37 cookies and I think those are all the mistakes I made. Plus, plus, I didn't limit the questioning to anything reasonable. You know, people were asking me, who scored Auburn's second touchdown in the LSU game in 1989? <laughs> and, and I said I could answer anything. So, <laughs> like... I, I got 37 questions wrong, but I got like, I was keeping track. I got like 65 or 70 right. So I was still like, I should have limited this to like, okay, I'm going to answer 20 questions, 30 <laughs> questions, something like not over a hundred questions. So, yeah. Made a few mistakes. So, so could I ask you, you know, like, I mean, like for that, would you have accepted like how old is, uh, Kirk, how, how old is Kirk Ferentz's youngest child? Or how much no, does Brett... It had to be, it had what's, to be what's, a football question. Okay, what's what's Brett Bielema's exact weight? <laughs> Would you... Well, that's nobody, what, um, well, nobody asked. God, that ridiculous. I thought the one that I just said was ridiculous enough. Okay. Yeah, I, I, well, I, don't, I don't know the scoring summary of every game in the history of the sport, you know, that's, yeah. that's a bit much to, to expect. Well, I watched your, uh, your trivia with, uh, with your friend, Joey Foster the other day, and you really got upset about some of those mascot questions. Yeah. I don't want to answer questions about mascots. I don't care about mascots. <laughs> that's not college football. I, I, it just, or that that is college football. I correct myself there. It's not testing what I consider to be my football knowledge. So, oh, by the way, I know that this call has lasted a lot longer than you wanted. But have you given your? And I mean this sincerely. Have you brought up uh, Howie Schwab's pass passing? Uh, no, I have not. And uh, you contacted me earlier today and sent that DM to me. And when that show was released, uh, he's a guy that I talked to once or twice. I'm not going to say that I knew him or he knew me, but he was at ESPN and his hey, actually, he probably preceded me. And then it carried into my first days or years at ESPN. And I thought that that... Like I used to get in a, in no way folks, am I bragging when I say this, this is just the truth. People would say to me on a regular basis, we would love to see you uh, take on Stump the Schwab. We would love to see that because back then I did truly know a lot more than I do now. I followed baseball to the letter and the NFL, et cetera. That was, but yeah, I, that's, that's sad news. That is sad news. Stump the Schwab was a, uh... I mean, I, I was pretty young, but I remember watching that on ESPN Classic, and uh, 
one of my favorite shows to watch. And, and, and just to clarify, because again, I don't want to make it sound like I'm, uh, he knew so much more than me, but within those three sports, we would have had a really good tussle, but he knew grand slam tennis events and golf yeah. and everything. Yeah. He knew I, I hockey. Yeah. Forget that. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yes, it is. Yeah. And, and he, uh, he was doing NCAA bracketology, I think for Fox, uh, up until okay. not that long ago. Uh, I lost track of him. Um, and it, it's too bad that, that, you know, like a show like that could, couldn't have stayed in existence longer. But uh, anyways, that, that was sad news. Uh, did, did, so back to the Oreos. Do you like the blonde Oreos? Oh, you didn't. Yeah, I didn't actually answer your question. In a normal sitting, I'm going to eat... 18 or 20. That's probably. Wow. That's, no. that's quite a bit. Now, do you like the blonde Oreos? Yes, I do. I do too. Now, do you like, or actually they're not called blonde. They're called golden Oreos, yeah. right? Yes. But uh, do you like the mega stuffed? Uh, I've had them. I, I don't recall. Like you almost can't have enough stuffing. So I'm sure I enjoyed them, but I don't remember <laughs> like seeking them out after that. I just kind of, the, do, the do double you, stuff is sufficient. You, <laughs> you know, that, I, we need to make that, can, here, listen, who's doing your merch store? Is it Joey? Yes. We need to put, get that on a shirt. You can't have enough stuffing. And people can wear that whenever they have a turkey dinner, whenever they eat Oreos, whenever they go to build a bear workshop, always that, that. You cannot have enough stuffing. That's your new slogan. That works I'm, for so many different things. As you were talking, I'm feeling the fat around my gut and <laughs> reminding myself that I need to keep myself in check. And also, Joey released a couple merchandise uh, offers that I need to go check out because I haven't seen them. But he apparently has put a few things that I say on merch, one being... Be a fan, just don't be a dumb fan. <laughs> you really like that one, don't you? I do. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, and you like, you, you've told me before, you, you really like cookies and cream ice cream. You're just trying to make it home. No, I, I'm just recapping as it relates to Oreos. Cookies and cream ice cream. And then the one that I wanted to ask you about is, you, and I know Sam's Club has them have you ever had the the uh oreos uh, i think they're on a stick but the oreo ice cream sandwiches yes those are pretty good i i just love the standard old school ice cream sandwich just the chocolate cake with the oh. vanilla ice cream chocolate cake well it's chocolate it's a cracker cake whatever it's made out of oh oh you're talking okay you're talking this about the like the the classic a, classic yes, ones yes i'll tell you you know what the, and i told you i think we've had this haven't we had this discussion before didn't we have a discussion about ice cream sandwiches like literally a week ago we've had many food conversations and by the way i have had someone make for me home well not really homemade chocolate Oreo or Oreo ice cream, but they melted there. There is a recipe where you melt the ice cream and then you actually insert actual Oreos and then there's, there's more to it, but then <laughs> I remember the, uh, I can't remember I'm trying to think what they were, but they were, uh, chocolate covered white chocolate covered Oreo balls. Yes. <laughs> there, was are... a, there was a chef at ESPN. Vinny, Vinny, if you're watching, which of course you're not, there's only 50 some people watching at this point, but Vinny, if you're watching, so Vinny would make up any kind of con concoctions. He would take Oreos and he would deep fry them. That was good. Deep fried Oreos are a big thing at the Iowa State Fair, Mark. Okay. Huge thing at the Iowa State Fair. Um, and they are, no, they, they are really good. Um, there was one other thing I was going to ask you about. Now I can't remember what it was, but you know, you know, one of my favorite things to do at ESPN was is 
every night, I believe this, well, I, there were two different things, two different stops I would make through the cafeteria in addition to other stops through the cafeteria. But one was at 9 p.m., they took all the cookies and they just set them out for free. <laughs> so I'd, I'd make a stop through at nine o'clock. And then at the end of the night, at various times, they closed at midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning that they would throw everything away because they were closing down. And I would come through and they'd hand me a pizza box and they would throw all the cookies in there and I'd take them with me. And that reminds me, I think this is the conversation we had, I think, just about a week ago. One of the most dangerous things for me as it relates to, to sweets is homemade, like really good chocolate chip cookies. And you smash homemade vanilla ice cream in between those homemade chocolate chip cookies. Oh, like yeah. that, that combination is just incredible i mean i i would almost quit your show for that mark i i you know i, I if i had if i had to because there there is almost nothing like homemade cookies on a, on either side of a, a scoop just a single scoop of homemade oh, yeah. vanilla ice cream yeah yeah that's that is tough to beat right there so well i was that's i was I was disappointed. I'll say this. This will be my closing bit uh, because it comes to mind. I was uh, about I was making a furniture trip, looking at furniture. So I was like an hour and a half because there were certain certain furniture area that was suggested to me anyway. So I'm I'm somewhat out of town furniture shopping last weekend. And I saw there was a Krispy Kreme in the furniture store plaza. So I drove through the Krispy Kreme. I specifically ordered two cream sticks, two chocolate cream sticks. Cream I sticks? Cream sticks. I don't know whether, what that is. Whether they're in a stick form where they look like a stick or they're made as a regular donut, the, the, the basic part of this is there's just, it's a cream filled Full of sugar. Yeah. The donut. Yeah. It's a glazed donut filled with sugar. And then you can get either maple on top, icing, or chocolate. So I got two right. chocolate. And I don't know what this pe person didn't understand, but I get into my, I get on the highway, I get into my bag, and they just gave me two donuts with chocolate icing on them. Oh, that's okay too, Mark. Well, they were okay. They were fine, but I ordered cream sticks. I was so looking forward to my drive home with my cream sticks. Well, you know what a bit better than that is if you had gotten two cream sticks and the two donuts. <laughs> well, sure. <laughs> would have. I, was, I, was been be, better than I was trying to be good. And I, you know, good. a lot of, a lot of these furniture stores, they, they, what is this thing with furniture stores? They all throw cookies and donuts at you. Well, there's the Ikea. They Ikea does the same thing. thing. Yeah. So, anyways. Well, what else you got for me, Mark? That's all I got. I've got nothing else. I do hope that the influence, and I believe the influence of uh, being close to some friends who eat extremely, extremely clean, meaning no processed foods, all of that, it's it's helping me a little bit. I, I could not agree more. Uh, trying to cut out processed foods is a big step I mean, just in general because everything around us is just everything's thrown at you constantly you know what i had today besides the not that uh, this is i'm not going to go on another rant but i'm just going to tell you real quick because i was in iowa city all day right you've got to eat and i'm not going to put a little you know stick and handkerchief over my shoulder like i'm in third grade and have a little lunch so course i had to buy something i ended up getting i won't even say where they're from chicken nuggets onion rings and a, and a junior cheeseburger so that was what you know you're on the run mark you know what this is like when you're on yeah. the run constantly you end up eating garbage because gar that's what that's what's out there yes 
and that's what's easy to buy. And it's this problem with society. So yep. it really, it does, it takes a lot of effort to improve diet. And, uh, obviously you and I don't really struggle with weight, but that doesn't mean that it's good for your health. True. Yes. All right, everyone. It's the great Corey Bratta from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Corey, right, stay Mark. awake. I'll, yep, I'll talk to you Tuesday. Sounds good, sir. Appreciate it. Yes, Corey Bratta from the Hawkeye of the Storm. And if you want the complete rundown on Iowa football and today's spring practice, not a spring game, spring practice, then certainly check out uh, what Corey has available there. Uh, I believe that uh, while I will be hard at work at times tomorrow, I don't think you will see me tomorrow here at the Voice of College Football, but bright and early on Monday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Time, Wake Up College Football. Bright and early, 8 a.m. Eastern Time, Wake Up College Football. You say, Mark, what is that? Just another live stream? No, it's not just another live stream. Not when it looks like that. So it's Wake Up College Football. That's Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Right here. Thank you for being here, everyone. Appreciate it. Jim R., thank you for being a member on our YouTube channel memberships. Right here at the Voice of College Football. We will see you soon.